Hello, welcome to this History News Live. I'm seeing some people coming in already, doing their greetings. We'll get to those in just a second. As you can see, I am in front of another wonderful green screen background. Thank you to Steve for sending this over. While I'm doing the hellos, can you guess where I'm currently sitting? No answers from you, Steve, because you did send it over, so that would be cheating. Uh, let's say some hellos. Hello, Alicia. Thank you for listening in. Uh, sorry about people to join us for the chat. Hopefully you, you can leave some comments on your thoughts later. If you are watching, anybody who is watching live, thank you so much for joining. If you're watching on the playback, incredibly grateful that you're giving me your time at whatever point you're doing so. Patricia, hello from Kettering in Northamptonshire. Thank you so much for your kind words as well. Hello, Scarlett. Welcome, welcome. And Stuart, hello. Thank you for joining. Rumple Stilts in Snubbuckle, good afternoon. It's evening here, it's just gone half past eight for me. Hello, Steve, thank you so much for joining. Hi, Shane. Yes, so for those of you who are on my mailing list, the last email that was sent out included a little photo of my son in a window at the council chamber at Hampton Court. My son now does, when I say to him, shall we go to Hampton Court Palace, he does a little dance and goes, Hampton Court Palace, Hampton Court Palace, as if he does the same dance when we say it's time for soft play. So I think that the indoctrination is working. I have high hopes. He does love a castle as well, that child. Loves a castle. Um, getting some book recommendations coming in as well. So make sure you check out the live chat if you're looking for some book no, uh, ideas. Hello, Coco. Happy Monday. And yes, indeed. Happy Monday. And uh, hope you all had a lovely weekend. And indeed, a lovely fortnight just gone. Hi, Sharon and Lizzie. Thank you. Nicola, yes, my son is currently being put, put to bed. <laughs> I don't know how old yours are. You, it sounds plural. So um, best of luck. <laughs> Sometimes. It could be an easy thing, can't it, putting a child to bed? And sometimes it, it feels like um, a lesson in endurance and patience. <laughs> it feels biblical. <laughs> upon occasion. Upon occasion. Oh, Laurie's coming in from California. Uh, it's just, do you know what? We had a bit of sun last week here in the UK. We're in London, um, and then it's got cold again. The temp has dropped right down. Malta, hello, Christine from Malta. And Bebop coming in from Yorkshire, hello, hello. Fabulous. Oh, Jennifer's just dobbed in a tour guide. You went on a tour in Scotland, and the guide didn't know the difference between Mary the First and Mary Queen of Scots. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. A slip, of, a slip of the tongue, mayhap? A slip of the tongue, mayhap. I don't think so, though. I don't think so. Now, oh, Nicola, 14 and 11. It's crept over the years, and now they want me to read four books apiece. <laughs> Do you know what, though? It's absolutely fabulous that you're, particularly your 14-year-old, uh, still wants you to read them books, four books at bedtime. That is promising indeed. Promising indeed. You didn't want to correct him. He said it twice. I felt rude. I, it's really difficult sometimes when things get said and you think, and the worst is when they're not talking to me, but I overhear, I overhear somebody <laughs> saying something it's bad when they're a guide um with a group but I have been known at, at one point I was I was walking over Tower Bridge with my husband and I heard a guy talking to his girlfriend or date <clears throat> and something he said I was like nope and I, I could feel my husband sort of tense up <laughs> immediately we're right by the tower I could feel my husband tense up as if to go don't do it don't do it and I just went um actually 
turned on my heel uh, and hit them hard with the history stick. And in fairness, the girl was very appreciative. I dare look at the bloke um, because I don't think he would have been quite so amused. Um, so have we got any ideas about what I was sitting in front of? I'm not seeing any suggestions coming in. Any suggestions for where I am? I'll give you a little, little second to have another thought about it. So today we have got some updates, repatriation and decolonization news. We've got some new news. The new news, the end of it, there's a new news with a perhaps ding dong adjacent. So it's a new news ding dong, maybe. Uh, a la and we also have some events and exhibitions. Alas, the Opera Pin Board is still not behaving for me. I don't know. I might try and uninstall and reinstall it. It's just, it's um, it's not doing what I want to do. However, we have got all of the articles listed and numbered in the description box. You will notice that the numbers on the bottom of the slide that will be on screen soon, they will correspond to the articles that are listed in the description box. I have got lots of people to thank for sending me articles. I will be sharing that thanks in just a moment. And I have also seen today some articles coming in. They haven't been added to this slideshow yet. So if they are new from what we've, we're talking about today, they will be in next time's one. So what have we got? We have got Laurie's going for, it's a castle in Europe, I'm sure of it. Yes, yes. Um, Melissa, you are, even though we've got a, a potential non ding dong, I've still got my little, my little piddling boy is here ready for the, for the surreptitious ding dong. It's not Hampton Court Aurora. Steve does say it's a bit obscure. Perhaps if this might whet people's apple appetites for going to see this place. So I'm going to tell you, this is the upstairs dining room of Bolsover Castle in Derbyshire. Uh, and I, it looks absolutely, it's not somewhere I've visited, but it does look fabulous. That, um, which way, that way, that way. <laughs> that relief work is just incredible. Um, so yes, certainly, certainly a place to go and check out. Um, Steve said, it's William Cavendish, Cavendish's Derbyshire holiday home. So it's that looks absolutely fabulous. It's really whetted my appetite to go and uh, have it have a check of it, check that out. Scarlett, yes, there's frequently the very the very wealthy wealthy have will have more than one dining room, mostly because they will have like a staff canteen. In fact, at Hampton Court, the Great Hall, uh, despite what various TV and film might show you of of Henry VIII up on the dais gnawing on a beef bone or whatever and shouting huzzah and grabbing a wench, whatever um, that might show you, most of the time he is eating in his privy apartments with his closest intimate friends. Uh, that is the staff canteen. In some cases, what the, the room behind the Great Hall of Hampton Courts, the Great Watching Chamber, would be used for another set of dining for higher ups. Those enormous hall spaces... They make, a pe they make people feel overawed. They make people feel small. And monarchs, particularly Tudor monarchs, don't like to feel small. So, yes, frequently more than one dining room. Also, we've talked about, in my video on Nonsuch Palace, I talked about a banqueting house. Um, and a, a lot of conversation was about how small the banqueting house is. And that, I think, is, is because we think that those big style meals that are happening the feasts we call those banquets but for our early modern counterparts the banquet is a course and it's usually like subtleties and sweets and things like that that are in this case taken elsewhere and almost like a almost like a folly within the gardens of of where you are so it would have like maybe marzipan or or sugar sculptures and things like that. And it would be the very special guests that would go to that. Seeing what the comments are. Amy, watching from the South Carolina mountains. Fabulous. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Leslie, very close to you. You've only been on the outside. Well, 
have a have a gander inside if you can and uh, give us some feedback give us some feedback i did also see somebody mentioned dover castle Sh yes stuart you mentioned dover castle dover castle is decorated currently uh, and has been for the last mm, i want to say 20 years they did a whole refit of it um and it's decorated with hangings and furniture etc to look the way it would have looked when it was first done up and completed it you know in the kind of Angevin to Plantagenet periods so that is also super worth a look um Dover is fabulous and the work they've done there because it's not just the one room that's been reconstructed you've got the dining hall you've got the audience chamber you've got king's bed chamber you've got guest bed chamber the kitchens are all done as if basically henry's court just downed tools and walked away so yes very worth a look jack has said this that youtube has removed this channel from my list of subscriptions twice since january i don't know why youtube does this it's why i at the end of every video i bang on I bang on about it and I say, please check you're still subscribed. I don't know why YouTube does it. I've got no idea. If you think you want to be subscribed, please have a check now just to make sure that you haven't been unsubscribed. Or there's a very good chance that if you're here, then you were notified, I'm imagining. Um, Shane, did I enjoy my trip to Sudley with Catherine and Philippa? I certainly did. It's always lovely to to see the ladies in person uh, and to hang out with them. And in fact, the stick around to the end because the last event that I will be talking about heavily involves the good lady Philippa and uh, very exciting things going, going on. Melissa points out that the Dover Castle refit was a time team special, absolutely was. So if you can't make it to Dover, the, I think correct me if I'm wrong, I think that that refit is now available on YouTube. So you can have a sneaky peek and have a look inside uh, at what's going on. It is fabulous. And over the half term holiday <coughs> in February, I was very privileged to go down there and work and do some historical interpretation as a trubarit, a medieval trubarit. And it was absolutely fabulous a real treat to be working in that space incredible hey make monarchies we were in very much in kind of um conversation about whether or not we could do that um however we had the extreme privilege of being in the sort of behind the scenes more private space uh at Sudley so it wasn't appropriate for us to film there and also we were there for Sam and she was very very kindly giving us incredible experiences without us having to pay for it so it, we were we helped her out doing the gown draw but you know we were there she was feeding us <laughs> and you know have car we'll drive for food and we also got to experience some amazing experiences with falconry demonstration and getting to handle some of those birds so it it would have been lovely to have vlogged it but it wasn't really our event to vlog if you know what I mean um but hopefully we will get to do some other similar things and the shenanigans will go on but we will of course we're going to be on YouTube live on Wednesday night and this week it's a rant week so we, <laughs> we're going to be spicy <laughs> right let me we're already a quarter of an hour in let's jump into the thanks shall we so today for sending me news articles I have to thank Sherry, Alicia, Yvonne, Natalie, my name twin cat thank you to Jesse, the lovely long-suffering Mr Dr Cat has also sent me news so thank you uh Kathy Alberta, Michelle, to Mary, Shane, Jennifer, Carve Phelan, Amy, Sarah, Joseph, and Pandora Snudpuckle. Thank you so very much for sending me these news items. I am, as always, 
very grateful. And so now, without further ado, let us hop in to the updates. Now, this is based upon something that was mentioned, I believe, in last time's one, and I wasn't quite sure what was going on with it. This notion that because of climate change, the way in which we do archaeology might have to change. And here we have an article explaining why not just microplastics, that was the thing last time, but also carbon dating might be in peril, I suppose. So this points out that researchers have talked about how the Earth is, a, is around 4.45 billion years old. The earliest evidence of the genus that makes up what becomes human beings dates to about 2.8 million years ago. The oldest artwork to about 40,000 years ago. All of these dates come from radiometric dating, a process that looks at different isotopes in samples. Some isotopes decay faster than others, and the ratio between isotopes can provide a date. Most um, in, in early human history, most of this is done through carbon isotopes, but apparently that method has a problem, and apparently the problem is getting worse. Carbon atoms in the air end up in all sorts of organic materials. Plants draw in carbon dioxide. Animals and humans eat the plants. The carbon ends up building tissues, including the isotope, carbon-14, which is unstable. When a plant or animal dies, it no longer incorporates new carbon-14, and the atoms already present start to decay to the non-radioactive isotopes carbon-12, and it also says carbon-12, so I'm assuming it means something else. Older remains have less carbon-14 as a result, so thus the less carbon-14 you have, the closer you can get to figure out when something died, and thus when it lived. Quote, this quote says, with fossil fuel emissions increasing at current rates, within the next 20 to 30 years, it will be difficult to distinguish newly produced materials from historical artefacts several hundred years old using radiocarbon dating techniques. Apparently, if the calculations are correct, carbon dating as we know it will no longer be reliable by the year 2030, which means scientists won't be able to use carbon dating to distinguish between new materials and artefacts that are hundreds or even thousands of years old. Carbon dating is apparently already limited in scope because older artefacts have to be dated using other methods. For instance, Lucy, the 3.2 million year old human ancestor, was dated by scientists who studied the volcanic flows and ashes in deposits where her bones were found. Researchers are now going to have to look for other clues to find out if the finds they have are modern or ancient. This, though, is going to be the loss of a very important tool. So climate change, not just damaging and jeopardising the future of artefacts in museums, but also the way in which we can interpret and understand them. And potentially as well, it's inspiring people to do acts of vandalism towards them when they are a museum. So all sorts of things are going on. Update number two, those Greek vases, Christie's have now withdrawn them from sale. These four ancient Greek vases, they were supposed to be auctioned and uh, a leading archaeologist, this is again, Dr. Christos Tiriogannis. He is the uh, academic who has been involved with the Manhattan DA and has been providing assistance to the Manhattan DA, DA Alvin Bragg and his team. More recently, he has called into question their practices for attributing his research to him and pointing out just how helpful his research has been in bringing these pieces to light and making sure they get back to their own homes. Anyway, he is, <coughs> he is affiliated with the University of Cambridge. He specialises in looted and trafficked antiquities and the networks. And he has told this newspaper that there was damning evidence within Christie's own correspondence with the antiques dealer, which was then seized by the police. Dr. Christos Giganis criticised the auction house for failing to reveal the objects that were planned to be part of their 9th of April New York au auction, they didn't reveal they could be traced to a man called Gianfranco Bacina, who had been convicted back in 2011 
of dealing illegally in antiquities. The antiquities in this case include an attic cup decorated with warriors and other figures that dates to around 570 to 560 BCE. With an est it was estimated it was going to fetch between $15,000 to $20,000. Um, this has now apparently disappeared from the online page. The sale catalogue refers to ancient Greek vases collected by Dr. Manfred Zimmermann that rank among the finest private collections of its kind that were assembled during the late 20th or early 21st century. It, additionally, the other disputed antiquities include the lid of a lacanis or bowl decorated with sphinxes, uh, also a hydra or water pot featuring Dionysus with a drinking horn. This has also been removed from the online catalogue. It, they talk about how this particular academic over the last 18 years has identified more than 1,700 loose antiquities within auction houses, galleries, museums and private collections. That so he has then notified Interpol and other police forces. While he's based in Cambridge, he does head illicit antiquities trafficking research for the UNESCO chair on threats to cultural heritage at the Ionian University in Corfu, Greece. The another apparently there was another uh, withdrawn vase from sale previously called, uh, listed as lot twenty, which was an oil jar or a lekthos lekithos depicting the Athenian hero Theseus. So we are talking about tens of thousands of pounds for each of these items that have been pulled from sale. Sidiogarnis said, quote, there is no condition report on the piece in the Christie's catalogue. It's now in perfect condition, but they don't say anything. According to handwritten notes by Pacina himself, the Lexios was delivered to him on the 21st of April 1990, which explains how Zimmerman acquired it in the early 1990s. But what is omitted is the most crucial information that it's from that it is from Bacina, from the convicted looter Raffaele Monticelli. He added, quote, not the auction house, not the collector or his family, not even the museums are bothered to check with, with the authorities to see if they are involved in exhibiting illicit objects. A Christie spokesperson said, quote, Christie takes the subject of provenance research very seriously. This the singing the same old tune they sang before, allegedly, especially when it relates to cultural property. We publish our catalogues well in advance of our auctions and invite the public to review them. We have strict procedures in place to help us ensure that we only offer objects we are legally able to sell. And as part of that due diligence, we collaborate closely with public authorities and institutions all over the world. Any suggestion that Christie's new these objects originated from with Gio Franco Bacina is categorically false. When we were made aware that there could be documentation evidencing such a connection, we withdrew the work from sales for further research and we'll research this together with Italian authorities. <sighs> Christie's has enough money to have their own provenance research team it should not require, as far as I'm concerned, outside influence to point this out. These are four pieces in one auction from the same source that are being valued. If you can value it at tens of thousands of pounds, you know enough. If, if you are able to value it, you should be able, as an auction house, be able to do Provenance and part of that value should be a full and clear provenance, as far as I'm concerned. Allegedly, I don't think this is the last time that we'll be hearing about an auction house doing some shenanigans. All this happened before, and all this happened again. We've got an update on the Asante gold that's being returned to Ghana after 150 years. This is the 32 gold and silver items coming out of the VNA and the British Museum. And um, these have been, they were stolen from the court of the Asante King around 150 years ago. 
They're now being returned to the current king. This is not going back as a full repatriation. It's going back as a long-term loan. There are, I think, complexities with it being a long-term loan rather than a full repatriation. This is, though, a repatriation in all but name. I don't know. I think this, this is something that requires further conversation. I don't know where what is the thing that should be privileged. For example, I think that the British Museum might be willing to send the Parthenon marbles back on a long-term loan basis. Understandably, I feel, Greek authorities don't want it on a long-term loan basis. They want a repatriation. They want a recognition of appropriate and rightful ownership. However, in that demand, which I think is totally fair, the Parthenon sculptures remain in the British Museum. What we have here is the items returning to, where, to whence they have been asked to return, and it's being done on a long-term loan basis. It would be interesting if something were, if there were to be some, you know, degradation or damage, then I wonder if it's on a long-term loan, who is responsible for paying for any repairs, upkeep, preservation work? Because if it's not, if it doesn't belong to the new Asante king, if the, if the authorities in Ghana are only loaning it, then who's responsible for the expense of maintaining it? Is it still these institutions? In which case, that's quite interesting. When it comes to insuring it in case damage against damage, theft or loss, then who is who is in charge of that? Manda, I, I, I and this is the other thing. If these if these items when when they are examined in Ghana are found to have been damaged, first of all, in the 150 years, how can you prove they were damaged before? But if they are found to be damaged, then whose responsibility is that? This is one of the things that, that then becomes muddy and murky when you're essentially doing a repatriation in everything but name. What happens, the background stuff? The, Melissa, if it's stolen, who gets the insurance claim? Again, a question that a question that I would love to know the answer to. And it feels muddy and murky. Um, I don't know. Interesting. Uh, Jen, they would love you to believe this. But the British Museum has warehouses full of stuff that is not on display. The and the when these items are objects of cultural significance or perhaps even human remains that are significant to another country, and they were taken through looting so something that is recognized now as being a war crime when that happens just because it's been stolen for a while doesn't mean it's not stolen goods and stolen goods get returned a sale is different potentially depending on who has the rights to sell but uh, but just because you've held it for a long time doesn't mean it wasn't stolen in the first place. I think it's been given to the Asante King because that's who it was looted from in the first place. And I 
we uh, uh, in the UK can't really comment because the Royal Collection still holds a whole bunch of stuff. So technically things do still belong to the Crown. Some looted things belong to the Crown, I think. Um, Melissa, as, and I agree, I'm, I, I am also for exhibiting replicas. We are very, very comfortable, as I've talked about lots and lots of times. One of the most iconic things, uh, artefacts to be exhibited in a museum is in the Natural History Museum. And that would be the Dippy when Dippy was in the in the main hall, and children for centuries, uh, decades certainly, have stood by Dippy for a photograph. They have gone and bought a Diplodocus in the gift shop and taken it home. Dippy was a cast; it was a replica, and we've loved it. We've always loved it. We haven't bothered. So, returned items in this case are a gold peace pipe, a sword of state, gold badges worn by officials that were charged, was, that was their duty was cleansing the soul of the king. These are the ultimate symbol of the Asante royal government and are believed to be invested with the spirits of former Asante kings. This loan was negotiated with the king and not with the Ghanaian government. The loan will last for three years with the option to extend for a further three years. So we'll have to see what's going to happen. The v &A is lending 17 pieces. Uh, the 15 are coming from the British Museum. Both museums said they are delighted to be able to return the objects on loan as part of an important cultural collaboration. The, we, it points out again that some museums in the UK, so the V&A and the British Museum, which, which receive government funding, they are banned by law from permanently giving back contested items in their collections. And loan deals such as this are seen as a way for objects to return to their country of origin. There is some there is some question because there is a, a, a loophole, shall we say, in this law about deaccessioning and repatriating items that one can remove them if they are not appropriate for display, whatever that means, whatever that means. So most of the items the V&A returned were bought at an auction on the 18th of April, 1874 at Garrard's. They are the jewellers that maintain the UK's crown jewels. The ones from the British Museum were apparently looted during a later conflict between 1895 and 96. The return of these artefacts comes as part of continuing debate with uh, items that were, this uses the word exported, um, that this is, of course, includes the Benin bronzes. This article refers to it as the Elgin marbles, also known as the Parthenon marbles. Interesting way of putting that around. Um, some countries laying claim to disputed artefacts fear that the loans might be used to imply they accept UK's ownership. However, these types of agreements are seen by others as a way for Britain to confront the cultural legacy of its colonial past while also building better relationships for the future. It's it's a look, it's a really hard question. And again, I don't know whether it's better for loans to happen so things are placed in the location to be cared for by a curatorial team, to be expressed, explored, used, engaged with in ways that are that bring them back to life and that place them in an appropriate context and an appropriate appropriate location. I wonder if that is sufficient or if they should be holding out for a recognition of true ownership. I don't know what the answer is, I, but that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons for continuing to have these conversations. And I hope to be having more of them. And I hope that at some point in the not too distant future, I will be involved in a project which is looking to confront these conversations, these questions and these conversations. And I want to be very, very clear. I don't think 
that we are anywhere close to a definitive answer on how to handle these items, how to handle decolonization and repatriation in museums, educational spaces, wherever it may be, street corners, I don't know. I don't think we're anywhere near having a hard, cut and dry, hard and fast system of this is the checklist. I think, though, the, the conversation and the questions need to be asked, possible answers and complexities need to be put forward. And it, it may well be that we are years, if not decades, away from coming to a consensus. I think, though, I think, though, a consensus will be reached by hook or by crook. I certainly hope so, because um, we were talking, you were talking high high up the, uh, Jen, you were saying that, that about history belonging to everybody, and I, I do agree with that. I do agree that world history and history from place in the world, we are, we are a global community and we are all shaped by it. For me, though, that implicitly requires that the artefacts and objects that we are using to understand that world history remain within a context as much as is possible that holds that relevance, that they are cared for, curated, and importantly described by communities and cultures for whom the understanding of their significance is so much more adept and clear because it's their heritage. And while it's affected all of us globally, if we truly want to understand it, then it needs to be in spaces where we can see it for what it is. For me, that is about that is about preserving and conserving the history of these items. I think that we will understand the Parthenon sculptures better when they are returned with the other Parthenon sculptures, not only because they will be part of as much as possible, a cohesive entity, but also they are back within a cultural space, a heritage space, a location where they were designed to be, where that history is more closely affecting the lived experience, ideologies and heritage of the present day. So that's the way I feel about it, is that I think that I absolutely agree that history is for everybody and world history is for everybody because we are all we are part of this global community. But if we truly want to understand it, then we need those global items to be in situ. But. Again, these are that's my opinion, and these are, I think, questions and discussions that need to be had continuously. On the flip side, weirdly, um, the historic treasures of Gaza arguably are safe currently because of the very thing that I've just been complaining about. So this is talking about, in a strange twist of fate, some of the great historical treasures are safe in a warehouse in Switzerland. And ironically, it's all thanks to the blockade that made life in the Gaza Strip such a struggle for the past 16 years. Based on satellite images, the UN cultural organisation rec reckons some 41 historic sites have been damaged since Israel began pounding the besieged territory after the October 7th Hamas attack. On the ground, a archaeologist, Palestinian archaeologist, Fadel al Otol, keeps tabs on the destruction in real time. This is when he's got internet and electricity. He puts photos onto WhatsApp uh, and he's there's 40 other peers or so that he's that's in this WhatsApp group. A, he told by phone from Gaza, he said that all the archaeological remains in the north have been hit. 
um, that the damage to Gaza's history has been immense. This is a very long article. I wish I wish I could share the whole thing, but it's very long. So do check it out for for further context. So it, uh, a, a spokesperson from Israel has said that Israel maintains its commitments to international law, including by affording the necessary special protections. The There were 106 crates of artefacts ready to go uh, to be taken far from the war raging in Gaza. We are told that these objects are in good condition, that some bronze pieces were slightly corroded, that they've been re repackaged. The, 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 they had to just be sure that the convoy would not be blocked. They're waiting for the green light. But as they point out, any return is impossible for the moment, and discussions are now underway for a Gaza exhibition in Switzerland. There is some excitement about this idea. Cowdery said, the most important collection of objects from the history of Gaza is in Geneva. If there is a new show, it will allow the whole world to learn about our history. They point out it's an irony of history that these things are there because of this blockade. Uh, a new Gaza exhibition will once again show that Gaza is anything but a black hole. So we shall see whether that exhibition happens. If it does, I will, of course, share information about it. Kerry asks, do I think they should paint the path on as it was? This is another question, you see, because I often say when I'm taking groups around Hampton Court, I point out that, you know, the, the red brick would have been painted a deep red, that the vitrified bricks would have been painted black, that the concrete or cement in between would have been picked out in white, that the um, statues and roundels would have been gilded and painted. And there's a part of me that thinks, wouldn't it be amazing to get that kind of a view of how it would look. And similarly, you know, reconstructed fifth spaces like the globe, there's a question about how brightly painted they were. And there's the experimental archaeologist part of me is like, yeah, do it, paint it. But the preservationist in me is concerned about part of that object's history is the fact that that paint was stripped away so again it's a question that i don't i don't really know the answer to um but i am interested in the discussion and the debate i think there is there is certainly an argument for reconstructing the appearance of these items and buildings i don't know whether it has to be done physically or on the originals. There has been some great stuff done with reproductions. And I also think as AI tech and also augmented reality picks up, the there are more options, I think, for visualising the past in very interesting ways. Uh, Melissa points out that the the Benin bronzes, this is the other thing, is that the way in which the Benin bronzes are displayed in Western museums, there is a question about them, you know, essentially being displayed as a collection of objects, whereas in terms of what they represent and the stories they hold, that they are part of a narrative that requires particular hanging in particular orders in particular ways, particular kinds of display, that is potentially not being done. So so there is a question there as to whether by exhibiting them in this way, we are actually removing their story from them. I think similarly, when you are somewhere and there are, there are mummified remains of Egyptian pharaohs and their sarcophagi in behind the glass of a museum in London or America or wherever else, that is so out of context of where it should be seen and experienced. And also what was intended by the individual 
that has been mummified, but also by the people who preserved and prepared them and created those works of art. So, um, Gio Giada, what was the paint made from at Hampton Court? I believe the red was made from ochre. Uh, and I want to say that there was some lime involved or lye, lime or lye. I'm never sure what people are saying when they say that. As for what they use for the black, I'm not 100% sure. I will have, see if I can figure it out. Um, but yes, the kind of all of these, the medieval and early modern spaces were, were a riot of colour, whether it's tapestries on the walls, um, whether it's the painting on the walls, the furniture, lots of them as well like uh, were natural dye. So that fade happened over decades rather than centuries. But at the time of creation, the fabric of the garments that people are wearing, it would have been borderline migraine inducing to be in these spaces. Incredibly bright, incredibly bright. Uh, repatriation that may also be an update. I feel like we have talked about these stained glass that were apparently stolen from Rouen Cathedral, but I think it was in relation to another museum. Ah, crazy artist lady. The white would have been lime mortar. That makes some sense. Lime mortar. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure what the black is. Make a monarchy suggest charcoal. I'm not sure. I think it would have been. The only thing that's in my mind is bitumen, but that is because there's a painting at Petworth House of the witches meeting Macbeth that is it's fascinating. If you get a chance to go to Petworth, there's this painting that soon you won't be able to see anything of it because the artist used bitumen in the paint. And over the years, it's now essentially become a blackout. And in, in the not too distant future, it will just be a black canvas. So, really, really interesting. Um, but I don't think bitumen is what they used on the black diaper work. Julesy, you, you saw P talking about the Saxon church. I mean, people will repurpose things, and they have they have often done so, and those things can be reclaimed in very useful ways. Philippa is a good egg. Stick around for the end because uh, if you want to know more, if you want to know more, if you want to hang out with Philippa for a whole holiday, have I got have I got a, an event for you? Just hold fire. So here we have these stained glass windows. The Worcester Art Museum has announced on Wednesday that it has hired Daniel W. Healy to the newly created position of provenance research, research specialist. So this is now becoming the trend, it seems. He is a Worcester area native, we're told, and he's joined the museum from the Manhattan DA's office, where he served as an antiquities traffic analyst from 2021 to 2023. This is following two instances in recent months when this museum found itself caught up in controversies, controversies regarding the ownership of works in its collection. Um, this is part of a national trend, we're told, where North American cultural institutions have been called to account for their acquisition of art many years ago. So this museum transferred ownership of the Roman bronze portrait of a lady bust, which we did talk about in a previous thing, previous episode, that was transferred to the Manhattan DA's office. It had been, the museum had purchased this uh, bust uh, apparently in October 1966. And then they said a few days later that the museum would be hiring a provenance research specialist to undertake a scrutiny of its collection. And who better 
than the people who the team they had had to hand things over to. Then in January, it was one of three American museums, which we've talked about, accused of illegally possessing the 13th century stained glass window. I I think we talked about this in regards to another museum. This, the Worcester Museum's window depicts the messengers from Ephesus before the Emperor Theodosius II. This is an episode from the legend of the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus. It was painted between 1200 and 1210. They apparently acquired the this stained glass window in 1921. Healy, who is doing the who's going to be the provenance researcher, is completing his doctorate in Roman art and archaeology at Princeton. He's been awarded numerous research fellowships and has given papers on various parts of his scholarship. Quote, as a Worcester area native, I grew up visiting the museum and then later I was excited to learn about the museum's Antioch collection during my graduate studies. My familiarity with the museum and its collection makes it all the more meaningful for me to now join the museum's team in support of the important ongoing work of expanding what we know about the Worcester Museum's remarkable collection. So we shall see what's going to go on there. A 7th century BC Onecho, which was looted in World War II, has been re returned to Greece by the Hanover Museum. This is a wine jug, a wine jug from the 7th century BC, removed from Greece by German occupation in World War II. Returned to the municipality of Hanover by the returned by the municipality of Hanover and the August Ketzner. Kestner Museum, the Ministry of Culture announced the other week. This has, as we can see, a trefoil shaped mouth and cover, and it dates to from 620 to 600 BCE. We can still see traces of decoration around the neck. The culture minister of Greece, Lena Mendoni, we hear a lot from her when talking about the Parthenon sculptures, said, quote, the August Kestner Museum joins the group of international museums that have in recent years made great efforts to investigate the provenance issues of artefacts in their collections. These are museums whose officials have the courage to publicize the results of their research and return to Greece the objects they have determined are linked to illegal acts. The municipality of Hanover, in its commitment to return cultural artefacts that were stolen during the Nazi occupation to their legal owners, is returning this object of antiquity to Greece. The decision of the municipality of Hanover and the August Kestner Museum, Kestner Museum is actual proof of their wish to contribute to the restoration of the damage Greece's cultural heritage suffered, but also to defend the re reputation of the August Kestner Museum. Lena Mendoni is absolutely fabulous. She rightly is not going to let any of this drop. Even in this comment, where she is praising this institution's actions, the undercurrent, the, the barely veiled barb is clearly directed towards those institutions and museums that have not acted accordingly. This is, well, look at how well your brother's behaving. Why can't you be more like your brother? And I don't, I don't think, if anybody thinks that Greece is going to give up on the Parthenon sculptures, they are incorrect, incorrect. Kerry. Items might be repatriated in future through lawsuits like the Lady in Gold. Could you, the Lady in Gold, is is this something I've spoken about before? Things I do I do start to lose track a little bit. Is this something we've talked about already? Could you just flag to me what what you mean about the Lady in Gold? Are you, unless are you talking about the Klimt's portrait? That went back via a lawsuit, didn't it? 
it all it all starts to swim together. I I think that when when certainly I think that when items are held in private collections, lawsuits are going to be the way that repatriations happens. Ah, yes, the Clint. Okay, so that I believe was held. Was that held in the private collection? Is that one of the ones that was held in the? It was stolen, and then it was put on display, and then because it was stolen, the family challenge. Yes, I think that when you have essentially a plaintiff who is saying this rightfully belongs to me, my family, my descendants, I think that it seems to be, I don't know, I am not a law expert. It seems to be functioning somewhat differently than the legal challenge when a state says to another state's museum that you have our stuff. Um, it's it seems to be functioning differently when it's an individual saying that's mine, and I also think that it's easier when there is documentation of looting, coerced sale and other connected, particularly war crimes, that make those legal challenges easier. Not easy, but easier. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of why. We would perhaps need to speak to a lawyer to understand that better. But that's what, I, that's what I've seen, anyway. Um, the Met is, uh, is here again. <laughs> We're here again. Didn't order to its holdings. Found, hang on, we shouldn't have had that as well. Um, <laughs> so an ancient statue has been returned to Iraq. This, a Sumerian sculpture dating to the third millennium BCE. They have described the repatriation as a product of the mu museum's more intensive efforts to review the provenance of items in its collection. This had been in the collection for more than 70 years. Quote, the Met is committed to the responsible collecting of antiquities and to the shared stewardship of the world's cultural heritage. We are honoured to collaborate with the Republic of Iraq on the return of this sculpture. And we value the important relationships we have fostered with our colleagues there. The artif this artefact in particular has been on display there in recent decades until some galleries were closed. These works were removed during renovations that began in January 2023. It had also been included in special exhibitions at the Met and elsewhere. It's thought this was possibly a temple object depicting a figure of a nude man carrying a box on his head, possibly an offering. The Met last year announced a major new effort to scour its collections for looted art after facing increasing scrutiny from law enforcement officials, academics and the news media over the degree to which its collection included objects that had possibly been stolen. They hired a provenance research team and last month it said that it had appointed Sotheby's executive Lucian Simmons to fill the newly created position as the head of provenance research. A, this is the Met has obviously been in close contact with the Manhattan DA's office. Dozens of antiquities have been seized from the museum to be returned to countries that include Turkey, Egypt, and Italy. We are told that as part of a new push for transparency, the details of all returned objects, like the Iraqi artifact, will remain on the Met's website even after repatriation. The I think we are going to see that in coming years, we aren't going to hear about objects that were brought into the museum in the 2010s or the 2020s that are that now require repatriation. I think that the understanding of the sensitivity about needing to understand provenance is so high that this stuff isn't going to happen, or if it does, it's willful. Anybody who's hearing stories about this stuff happening uh, and the piece was acquired in 2024, that is willful. That is a willful desire to cover up what's gone on. There is no way people don't know anymore. But I think 
the issue with museums that have been open for a while is that this nobody was talking about this and people were getting away with it and it was accepted and so thus provenance understanding provenance research was not at the forefront of anybody's mind and so now what it's going to take is people going fine tooth combing through the tens of thousands, if not millions of objects that these large internationally reputationed institutions hold. They are going to have to go from A to Z of the catalogue to see what is going on with each individual piece that has been catalogued. This is going to take a while because a lot of this work wasn't done at the time of acquisition. And that is not the fault of the current team. They now have, they now have an enormous mess, somebody else's enormous mess, to clean up. So I do, there, is, there is a degree to which I feel sympathetic. And I'm pleased that they seem, that certainly the Met seems to be doing their very best to confront what must feel like a labyrinthine and Sisyphean, is that the way to say that? Sisyphean uh, task. But yeah. Manda, speaking of the Met, anyone excited, horrified to see what fashion atrocities are going to be commissioned at the Met Gala next month? Do, do we get the theme? I see. I only ever, I only realize it's, it's happening once it's happened, and somebody comes out wearing, I don't know, Notre Dame on their face or whatever. Um, do we find out the theme before the event, or do they start turning up, hopping out of their um, gas guzzling Hummers, and then do we find the theme when they rock up, or do we know what it is yet? Let's hope it's something tasteful. Probably won't be, but let's hope it's something tasteful. <laughs> Rumpel Stiltskin, Stumpuckle, you think Anna Wintour announced the theme before the event? Oh, hang on. Amanda says, the theme has been announced for months before the event. What's the theme then? What is the theme? Tell us the theme. Anybody on the Google? What's the Met Gala theme? Oh, it's Sleeping Beauties. Oh. Somebody's gonna somebody's gonna do dead people. Somebody's That's going to be, that's going to be, I, if I was invited, I would show up in Jimmy Jabbies. I would. Sleeping Beauty. So you're going to get some people doing like full bubblegum, candy floss, Disney fantasy. You're probably going to get some people doing like Victoria's Secret Angels Nightwear. Um, almost certainly somebody's going to be in, like, vintage. There's going to be Marabou, I think. And there's going to be dead people. There's going to be dead people. Someone's going to go stuff to pillow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. It's supposed to be about garment conservation. After the Monroe debacle, interessante, interessante. Um, so it's Sleeping Beauty's reawakening fashion is the exhibit that's on at the same time. Okay, so I, in in which case, then there's going to be, they're going to be pulling from. Ooh, maybe we'll see some really nice vintage Dior. Ooh.
Interesting. Okay. Let's see what they go with it. Let's see where they go with it. Our last piece of repatriation news. Why the daughter of an American archaeologist sent her father's collection to Peru? Well, the archaeologist John Howland Rowe died in 20, 2004. He did not leave any instructions on what to do with his archives and research materials. Um, Melissa points out about the Met. It, it's always about conservation. That's the purpose of the garlic. Yeah, so it's to, it's to fund the that the kind of conservation i suppose it it doesn't necessarily mean that the people who are going to put the frocks on have the slightest jot of an iota because they're dressed by stylists not conservators we'll see we'll see um i agree i mean if this were a challenge at a ball sleeping beauties this would be fire it would be fierce. It would be fierce. Uh, apparently, Amanda points out that this year's theme is based on a, a short story by J.G. Ballard, which I'm not familiar with. Um, okay, so lots of things to pull from. Lots of things to pull from. We shall see. So, his daughter, Anne P. Rowe, realised that it was up to her to determine the fate of the particular items. She decided that the materials should be sent to Peru, which was the country that had captivated her father through his six-decade six career. The father was an archaeologist and anthropologist known for his extensive research on Peru, specifically the Inca civilization. He got his PhD in 1947, started teaching at the University of California, Bar Berkeley, it's not Berkeley, there, it's Berkeley, uh, in 1948, and founded the Berkeley-based Institute of Andean Studies, Andean Studies, in 1960s. He con conducted excavations and also discovered a significant site linked to the pre-Inca Chanapata civilization. The materials transferred to Peru from this collection include around 88 books and 4,556 archaeological specimen, specimens, among them pottery fragments, animal bones, and a ceramic vessel that will be studied and exhibited to the public. As Anne explains, these artefacts were used by Roe, his associates and students to construct a chronology of the Peruvian highlands and coasts. So what we have here is some of the items photographed. Um, we are told that Roe, quote, did a lot of really important early work, especially his work with documents. He really opened that up and wrote things out that were just sitting there hiding. And he brought them out. Th that allowed people around the globe, but especially in South America, to really get to know the region's history from pre-Inca civilizations to the post-colonial period. It's pointed out that this is Richard L. Berger, who's a former student of his, said, quote, his attitude toward Peru could not have been further from that of many archaeologists in the 60s and 70s who viewed Peru as their laboratory to study cultural processes. His books travelled to the National Library of Peru in San Borja in two shipments. The first instalment of 28 books came in 2022. These materials ranged from 1607 to 1949. Of particular interest for three books printed in Lima at the beginning of the 17th century. Really interesting. Including a, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Quecha, Quecha Grammar and Vocabulary Manuals by the Jesuit priest Diego Gonzalez Holguin, Holguin, as well as a second edition of a chronicle of the Inca Empire by Inca Garcelizo de la Vega. 
This donation arrives uh, amid a global push to return cultural artefacts to their countries of origin. In a statement um, announcing Peru's acquisition of Rose Collection, as well as dozens of artefacts repatriated from Europe and the United States, the Peruvian Minister of Culture, Leslie Ortega Pena, said the country has received more than 7,014 cultural assets since 2019. She added, quote, we will keep moving forward to make sure we protect our precious heritage because Peru's cultural legacy constitutes a fundamental pillar for the formation of our identity as Peruvians. That Rose's work and artefacts are now included in that patrimony is a testament to the collaborative approach that defined his career. His former student wrote, he made it clear to all his students that working in Peru was a great privilege, as well as a serious responsibility. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Aurora points out that that's, that's actually pronounced Diego Gonzalez Holguin. So thank you very much for, for correcting that. Uh, on the Met Gala, do you honestly think most of them dress themselves to their events, blame their size? And, here's, and here is the thing. I think that people who are celebrities who in many cases aren't being used to told, being told no um, might ask for various things. They might have ideas. And their stylists, their fixers, go out and ask for things, approach people, say who it's for. And it's on the people who create the garments, hold the garments, whatever it might be, it's on them to say yes or no. And clearly, some institutions are concerned about the publicity and the cachet of having a connection to somebody who is famous, um, regardless of any potential cost. And it's it's a cost risk analysis, isn't it? That's what's going on. Um, and yeah, as Amanda points out, uh, most of our brand ambassadors have to wear certain designs as well. Absolutely. The, there are, there are making monarchies. They do, they do get the last word on what they wear without a shadow of a doubt. However, in the same way that my toddler gets the last word on what he eats, but lobster's not on offer <laughs> at the moment. He he is, there is a, I think when it comes to the very, very wealthy, not that I know, obviously, but the the celebrities and the very, very wealthy, there is in their the extremity of their wealth, I think there is an artificiality of belief that there is choice, unlimited choice, because while they might not be aware they're being told no, the people around them are being told no for certain things, I think. Um, so... And they are they are tied into contracts, you know. Billionaire sports stars who are sponsored by a sporting brand, many apply. Can they own trainers from other brands? Yeah, probably. If though they are on official business, is there an expectation they will be seen in it? Yeah. And if they're not, what's the cost? Okay, well, the brand might find them possibly i don't know depends what the contract is or they might say when this 12 month is up we're pulling we're pulling the sponsorship we'll work with somebody else so there are there are there is money involved in all of this kerry do you think dresses are art i think they can be i think that Fashion is storytelling. I think that fashion choices that individuals make are a product of their social setting, of their personality, of their expression. I think that the move from or kind of the real expansion 
of ready to wear going straight through to fast fashion is a movement that is is problematic but it, it's it's a I wonder how and, and there is a lot of waste uh obviously and massive issues around people being exploited in their labors the that doesn't mean though those items aren't art in some way shape or form and i think that that is a case whether you're thinking about a, a trainer or a ball gown or a wedding dress i mean i certainly think that for example the costumes that you see in disney cartoons the way in which they all sorts of people connect to those that you have Disney adults, Disney bounding in styles that replicate their favorite characters, that you have people who spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on their cosplay. The fact that my son's favorite thing in the world is his Elsa dress. He loves it more than anything in the world. He caught me for it in a supermarket and it cost me more than I wanted it to cost. But it's probably it's probably the thing that he loves the most. And you cannot tell me that that the, the person that first drew that and then took it, then the person that took that from a cartoon and made it into a physical object. You cannot tell me that there is not art involved in that. I think. Julesy, absolutely. That bit where in the Devil's where, where where Priestley goes on about cerulean and azure blue. Absolutely. And it's and it and it affects the it affects so much. Because, you know, the whole kind of like slightly <laughs> increasingly mocking trend of sad beige parents with their sad beige children, that sort of oatmeal, <laughs> the oatmeal rainbow, which if you like it, you like it, um, and the oatmeal coloured child in their oatmeal coloured clothing with their oatmeal coloured hat in their oatmeal coloured pram, that... Somebody made that choice so high up the fashion food chain in that it that it doesn't we probably I have no idea where that originates. None. But yeah. It really matters, I think. Anywho, we are now moving on to the new news. And we've got a child archaeologist. Love it. I lo we have to get these. We have to keep a track of them. Not in a creepy way. Um, we have to get a like a database of children with metal detectors and also uh, about apparently the power to find as this 11-year-old has on um, a beach in Somerset. the largest ever marine reptile. It's thought to belong to an ichthyosaur that roamed the sea about 202 million years ago. So another sweet baby, Mary Anning, coming in. Loving it. Um, the team have named, named the species Ichthyotitan seven nice sevenesis, meaning giant fish lizard of the seven, catchy. <laughs> it's, it's catchier in Latin. Um, <laughs> my husband's just immediately responded to, you can't put children in a database, <laughs> a baby cage maybe, but not a database. One of, one of our favourite things is that, you know those pictures <laughs> from like the 40s and 50s of like a chicken wire cage just hanging out of a six story apartment building and there's just a baby just a baby suspended in midair in some contraption that looks like it's used to hold chickens 
<laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so yes, uh, but apparently you you are right, Mister Doctor Cat. You couldn't put children in a database, but you know what I mean. So they think this would have been about twenty five meters in length. They do point out that you've got to be careful with estimates because it's only fragments of giant bones. The, they think that this was apparently still growing, which is, uh, they say, another twist. These are the ichthyosaurs are, um, we see squeeze box. Alive. Yes, they weren't dolls, my darling. They are. You can see this if you they're probably not called baby cages or are they called baby cages on Google? I don't know how I found them, but I did find them. Um, and Mandra is completely correct. They were used to give the babies fresh air. It's just, they are the most, like, I always get a sort of mor morbid fear and flop sweat when I see somebody's put one of those air conditioning units in a window and just close the window. And I'm like, that's, that's coming out. That's coming out. But that is what they're like. These, I don't know what they're hooked on with. Chewing gum and a prayer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Spit and hope is holding those things up. Um, have a little look. Have a little look. <laughs> it is very important for kids to get out and breathe all that super fresh, healthy pollution completely. And what I will point out is in most of these images of these kids in the baby cages, they are also, it's it's so smoggy. My husband said, if you want to have a look at them, if you Google, quote, baby cages, New York, <laughs> then you'll be on a database. <laughs> You'll be on a database. <laughs> That's how you get in a watch list. Uh, the past was wild, but then the, what all I think is, as somebody who is currently parenting a nearly four-year-old, <laughs> which is hard, guys. <laughs> three and a half is hard. Two is hard. Three and a half is is like two with more vinegar involved. <laughs> He's a spicy meatball. Um. I just think even in the space of, you know, five, six, ten years, things that we are now told to absolutely not do that were just commonplace, certainly when I was a kid, many moons ago, but also like even my friends who've got older children than mine are doing things. And I'm like, oh, we're not allowed to do that. So I wonder what in 40 or 50 years time people are going to look back on and be like, the past was weird, and they'll be talking about us. <laughs> they'll be talking all about us. Julesy, I, this is so right. Everyone has got a story about being dropped from their head. <laughs> we, are, we are fine. Fine is your, that is, that word is doing a lot of work, isn't it, though? Let's be honest. <laughs> I have a dent. You can probably see it. I have a dent in my skull. <laughs> Because I fell onto a music player when I was about three or four. Um, and I got two enormous black eyes. It looked like I'd been hit in the face with a cricket bat. Um, <laughs> nobody took me to hospital. <laughs> I was definitely concussed because my grandmother was trying to ice this enormous egg on my forehead. And I was laying in her lap screaming, why do you, why are you trying to kill me? So I was delusional at that time. They probably should have, um, probably should have taken me to hospital. Make up monarchy says, just Googled it. This is not history after dark. If you don't know what it is, I'm telling you, you can Google it. And they are hanging out of windows. I, when I tell you the baby cages are a lot, <laughs> the baby cages are a lot. Aurora Rose, finally someone agrees with me. My daughter wasn't a really terrible two, but she was an absolute night, a three-nager. Like two, they are just, they they can't, they have all these feelings and they haven't quite got, they get in there with the language to express it. So it's just all feelings and they're just very angry about them and very sad about them. And you can kind of get that. But at three, I mean, maybe it's just my kid, he is a button pusher. Like, I'll say to him, don't do that. And he looks over his shoulder at me, smirks. And it's like he goes, oh, I'm just going to, not touching, can't get angry. <laughs> he is, um, th it's three nages. It's, it's, it's still all of the kind of feelings, the big feelings. 
um, you know, tired, hungry, sleepy, doc, grumpy, whatever. Um, all of the dwarves. They, I like to say, he's morphing dwarves. Um, <laughs> he's he's all of Snow White's friends, but he now has the language to shout at you. <laughs> it's good times. It's good times. What did they do with babies in Tudor times? Um, they gave them to a wet nurse <laughs> and then they left the house. <laughs> they, the rich people gave them to, a, usually at that age, to a poorer person and then they went away. <laughs> and then they came back when it was toilet trained and able to hold at least some part of a reasonable conversation. <laughs> um, my husband said, at, at two, the baby is a honey badger on substances at three <laughs> everyone else is on substances and fighting a honey badger <laughs> oh yeah uh, at three and a half they can run fast every day he's a runner he's a track star he's a whip it and, and when you and when you tell him that's hot he can't not touch it he can't not Right. I was about to my little cousin on the bed and then he bounced into the ceiling. <laughs> See, <laughs> when I was like about 18 months old, my dad, for reasons that are known only to him, decided that he we were on holiday in a place with marble floors. I'm 18 months old and he decided that he was going to make the bed in him and my mum's room <laughs> while I was on it. <laughs> so I wasn't on it for very long. I did swan dive onto the marble floor and apparently he did go a very odd colour. <laughs> he did go green, um, but I was fine. You can't, you can't catch me. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, on with this ichthyosaur. Um, the first piece of this jawbone were discovered by Justin Reynolds and his daughter Ruby, who have been made co-authors on the paper. They were found at a beach at Blue Anchor in May 2020 when Ruby was 11. The team then came and fitted the fragments of the new fossil together and found it belonged to the same species as the specimen that was discovered by De La Salle. Um, the fossilised bone is the serangula, which is a long curved structure that sits at the top and the back of the lower jaw. When they first described the specimen in 2018, it had unusual features suggesting it might represent something new, but they did not give it a name, considering that it was incomplete and partially eroded. Now they've got two examples of the same bone with the same unique features from the same geologic time zone. It supports them having an identification of it as something new, especially when it's combined with the fact that the two bones appear roughly 13 million years after the latest geologic relatives with a name. It hints that its one-time owner was a gigantic beast, possibly one of the largest marine reptiles of all time. However, Frey said it was questionable whether the cre creature should be assigned as a new species. He says that, for me, it is too incomplete for that. So we shall see if more is found. Archaeologists have found that Neanderthals and Homo, sa Homo sapiens organised their living spaces similarly. In a study published in the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, Uni University of Montreal and University of Genoa archaeologists revealed that far from being more primitive, Neanderthals did much the same as their Homo sapiens successors, made themselves a home. They mapped the distribution of stone tools, animal bones, ochre and marine shells across the surface of the site and they were able to produce clear and interpretable models of the site's spatial patterns. 
They found distinct clusters of artifacts and materials to infer the, the behavioral significance of the group, different groups that lived and worked there. Quote, the homogeneity in spatial distribution hinted at an underlying structure in how these ancient humans utilized the space. Combining these spatial analyses with studies of lithic technology, faunal remains and marine shells, the researchers were able to paint a comprehensive picture of the behavioural similarities between these ancient populations. Similarities include that both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens exhibited a structured use of space, organising their live, living areas into distinct high and low intensity um, activity zones. This suggests a shared cognitive capacity for spatial organisation. They also had share uh, central tendencies of occupation for both groups, established throughout thousands of years of reoccupation. Recur the recurring position of the site's inner hearth and a refuse pit persisting across levels highlights the continuity in uh, of the layout. The organisation of three levels conditioned by land use and mobility strategies they articulate around variations in occupation duration, reoccupation intervals and number of occupants, and the nature of activities undertaken, pointing out that planning and organisation were key. However, the differences include the following. Neanderthal occupations show a lower intensity pattern compared to those of Homo sapiens. Artifact densities were lower deposit and fewer clusters were identified. There are distinct distribution pattern and use of space for each of the levels. Neanderthals use Reparo Bombrini sporadically as part of a high mobility system in the context of rapid clim climatic change, while Homo sapiens alternated between short and long term base camps to adjust to their new ter territory. <clears throat> <clears throat> we are told that this new study underscores the significance of directly comparing the spatial behavior of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens within the same site using consistent parameters to minimize analytical bias. The authors conclude that, quote, there's an underlying logic to how the space was used. Quote, like Homo sapiens, Neanderthals organized a living space in a structured way according to different tasks that took place there and to their needs. This is another study indicating that Neanderthals were more human than is generally assumed. Weezy squeeze box organized their home. What's that? I'm assuming that they had a floor drobe. Um, and as my husband said, that there was no flat surface they could find that was not covered very quickly with detritus. He thinks he's <laughs> my husband thinks I'm afraid of flat surfaces. <laughs> There's not a flat surface in our house that I can't fill with some form of detritus. <laughs> A 6,000-year-old <clears throat> elephant, elephant ivory vessel has been unearthed near Bathsheba. This is in southern Israel. This has been crafted out of elephant tusks, uh, and it dates to around 4,000 BCE. So... This, um, it's a type of vessel known to researchers as an amphor, amphor riscos, riscos, amphoriscos, which is a small jar. And it's thought to shed light on ancient trade connections between the Holy Land and Egypt some six millennia ago. The diameter of this container is approximately eight inches, exquisitely designed and skillfully crafted with small matching handles arranged symmetrically around its lower body and neck. It was found in 2020 at an archaeological site near Bathsheba in southern Israel. They were doing infrastructure work to lay a water pipe, apparently. At this time, they also found an old set of underground buildings um, and the they they discovered the edge of a basalt vessel during the last stage of the digs. These vessels were found within the excavation site after an extended church extended search. Sorry, 
And among them, they had the shattered remains of this ivory vessel carefully interred in antiquity. Quote, this find deep deepens our understanding of the Chalicothic period and of the cultural exchange ties of our region with both neighbouring and distant cultures. The vessel is well made and makes maximum use of the original tusk, which was a precious material. If it was manufactured here, it reveals the high standard of craftspeople who dwelt here, who knew how to treat ivory and also knew elephant anatomy. The IAA researchers... Uh, specialist from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and ivory conservationist Olga Negus, Neg Nezisky collaborated to analyze and restore the vessel. This was apparently a difficult and drawn out process. It's presented to the public in Jerusalem at the annual Israel Prehistoric Society Conference, along with <clears throat> other recent prehistoric discoveries. And we have got a discovery of pottery that is rewriting Aboriginal history. So this is the oldest pottery ever found in Australia. It is on Jiguru or Lizard Island, which is off the Queensland coast. And this is challenging the idea that Aboriginal Australian communities were unaware of pottery, manuf pottery manufacture before European settlements. There was a 2.4 metre deep midden that has been excavated over a two year period and to discover evidence of occupation. They found the remains of shellfish and fish collected and eaten by people on the island, more than 6,000 years old. And then a metre below the surface, they found dozens of pottery shards that date from between 2,000 to 3,000 years old. This is the oldest pottery ever discovered in Australia. Professor Ulm said that the discovery challenges previous notions that Aboriginal Australian communities were unaware of pottery manufacture before European settlement, instead suggesting a rich history of long-distance cultural exchanges and technological innovation long before the British arrival. Professor Ulm said that the discovery reveals that Aboriginal communities in North Queensland had connections with the pottery making communities of New Guinea. Quote, this discovery gives us insight into the sophisticated maritime capabilities of First Nations communities in this region. And these objects are crucial in understanding the cultural exchanges that occurred on Jiguru thousands of years ago. We think that the ancestors of contemporary traditional owners were engaged in a very widespread trading system. So they traded technology, goods and ideas, knew how to make poetry, knew how to make pottery and also poetry, I'm sure, and made it locally. This discovery as a new layer of our understanding of Jiguru and Indigenous Australians role in the broader network of maritime exchange and cultural interaction across the Coral Sea. <clears throat> These networks facilitated the exchange of objects and ideas between Australian and New Guinean coastal communities over the past 3,000 years. While some objects like cone shell body adornments and bamboo smoking pipes indicate widespread sharing of culture and ideas, others, such as pottery, also suggest the sharing of technology. Coco creates, ah, yes, the old indigenous people couldn't possibly do anything until us smart white people arrived, sigh. And this is one of the really problematic things about, um, obviously, the ancient aliens discussion and uh, pyramids as time travel, because at the base of that conspiracy theory is a very similar logic, of course. <laughs> Archaeologists are the trash pandas that fought for humanity. That's why we love them so. Um, Lorcan, the idea they wouldn't have known how to make pottery seems a little absurd. I've got to say, it wasn't when I when I first read this article, I didn't, I hadn't been aware that there was a a thought process that pottery and the technology to do it was something imported by Europeans. This was this was news to me. Um, 
because it hadn't it hadn't crossed my mind that there wouldn't have been i mean perhaps a different technique but like clay exists in soil in i mean i have as i think i've, I've made very clear my geography is only matched in its ineptitude by my capacity to do mathematics so i have geology and things connected to it geography etc i have no idea but i thought clay was just something that existed in lots of parts of the world my husband's typing he will clarify things for me very quickly i have no doubt um so if you if you're not if you have a natural resource of clay I mean, this is like saying we're, we're surprised to have learned that uh, First Nations people ate meat before Europeans. You've got meat. Well, of course you're going to eat it. But maybe that's just me kind of going, what's, go what's going on here? Let's see, what, see what the husband has to say. <clears throat> yes, I see... Crazy, I say, I, yes, exactly. Clay does exist naturally in the ground. My point was, I'm not sure if it exists in all ground globally. That was my query because I sort of assumed that it exists in all ground everywhere. But then, if they are questioning whether pottery was a thing that happened, maybe clay didn't exist. I do I I do get the um nomadic lifestyles might make it require a requirement or a desire to pair things back. But when you're prepared to take your house with you, what's a what's a few clay pots? Ah, so so my husband's explained that. Part of the issue is the ability for the landscape to store a record of the presence of property like ceramics. So there's basically been a lot of gap in the record because they've not been able to find stuff. So because they couldn't find... Ah, OK. So it's not about a lack of clay. It's about a lack of evidence of pottery remains being found in archaeological digs has made it seem like it didn't appear until later. This is the whole thing about the argument that syphilis didn't come to Europe until after Columbus came back from the Americas, which has, I, th I think, been challenged, if not widely disproven, because they have found 11th and 12th century European cemeteries full of people who died with syphilis. So it didn't come back with Columbus after 1492. Yeah, I'm, I'm, when I say they take their houses with them, I mean they take they take shelters with them. I, 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 I'm not saying that they kind of, I'm not calling them like mobile homes. Um, they're not taking a trailer with them. Um, but it, a planned nomadic move people do still take things don't they so <clears throat> we have also got a unique bronze miniature portrait of alexander the great has been found on the island of zealand in denmark this has been found by two amateur archaeologists near ringstead in the danish island of Zealand. This is a sign that one of history's greatest warlords was known in these parts. This is a bronze fitting with a portrait of Alexander the Great. This is a 26 by 20 to 28 millimeter diameter fitting cast in lead containing bronze alloy. It represents Alexander the Great, who is apparently easily recognized by the wavy locks of hair and the ram's horns by the ears, which he has after the god, the Zeus god, Amon. Amon, sorry. We are told this is a unique find in Scandinavia with connections to one of the most famous personalities in world history. 
absolutely one of the most famous personalities in world history. <clears throat> These were produced, I think, around 200 AD. So that is in the Roman Iron Age. The detector operator said, quote, actually, it's only when we handed over the find that and were later called by Philip the, that the story came out. They say going back 2,000 years in time creates great excitement. The Currently, the archaeologists don't know the function of this bronze fitting, the function of the bracket. Was it a decorative disc for the shield? Was it a sword belt bracket? Was it cast by the Romans who used the same lead-containing alloy for casting statuettes? Was it cast by the Romans from a remelted statuette? Or did the remelting take place on Zealand? If the bracket was cast by the Romans, how did it end up in a field near Ringstead? What's the meaning of Alexander the Great's portrait for the Germans who lived in Denmark around the year 200? Did they thought, think the portrait could bring luck on the battlefield? They point out the multiplicity of questions increases the beauty and unique value of the find and undoubtedly excites the expert to unravel the veil of mystery surrounding it. Fascinating. So we shall, hopefully we'll find out some, some more stuff about it. Interesting. A Greco-Illyrian helmet has been found by archaeologists from the Dubrovnik Museum near Zakotorak, which is in Croatia. The helmet, we're told, saw four phases of development between 700 to 500 BCE. It was used by ancient Greeks, Etruscans, Scythians and Illyrians. The excavations are being conducted uh, at this site by the Dubrovnik Museums, working in collaboration with the City Museum in Koroka and the uh, Dolenjensky Museum as well. This area has also played host and have, has been discovered there. Several burial mounds containing skeletal remains from the 4th century BCE. In association, they have found grave goods such as bronze clothing pins, bracelets, rings and a Greco-Illyrian helmet. They have now found this second Greco-Illyrian helmet made from bronze, uh, which was found in one of the drywall additions to a burial. We are told it's an extremely well-preserved state. A spokesperson from the Dubrovnik Museum said, quote, along with numerous finds of jewellery, costumes and grave goods, this find of a helmet contributes in many ways to the knowledge of funeral rituals of Illyrian communities in the second half of the last millennium BCE. And it, uh, it ranks the area of Pezzalak as one of the most important archaeological zones of the eastern Adriatic coast. Very interesting. Next up is something that I've been perhaps sent the most, but and I understand why it's very cool. We've got new Pompeii finds. New paintings have been found in Pompeii. This is part of a new excavation, and they have found these frescoes, which include images of mythical Greek figures like Helen of Troy. I'm going to have to just flip to a bigger vision of this because I cannot, for the life of me, read it. So I'm going to go straight to it on the website. There we go. I'm going to make it big. I need to get some glasses. Um, so this is a black room with a white mosaic floor. This is the current thing that's going on is, is being referred to as the biggest in a generation. Um, this black room was presented to the BBC uh, and it's thought that the wall stark colour was used to hide the smoke deposits that would have come from the lamps that were used to entertain after sunset. And in shimmering light, we're told these paintings would almost have come to life. Two set frescoes dominate. In one, the god Apollo is seen trying to seduce the priestess Cassandra. Her rejection of him leads to Cassandra's curse, her, where she is someone who can see the future, but uh, is never believed. And 
the tragic consequence of this curse is told in the second painting where Paris meets Helen. Uh, Cassandra knows this will doom them all, resulting in the Trojan War. Helen famously the face that launched a thousand ships, namely in war. This is going to form part of a documentary, this find, that's going, it's being filmed by the BBC and Lion TV, and it's due to be broadcast later in April. I don't know the exact date, if and when I do, or if any of you see any information about it, I will share it when we know. Um, they are moving quickly to protect the new find, move what they can to storerooms. The frescoes, of course, have to stay in position. So a plaster glue is injected to their rear, mm, dirty, to prevent them from coming away from the walls. The masonry is shored up with scaffolding and a temporary roof is going over the top. So this is enormous to, to look at it. And um, you can see from the, there's a picture of like a, there's a map of the excavations in Pompeii. Uh, and you can see where this new dig site is. It is fabulous. So, and they've got some other finds in there as well. I do recommend checking this out by clicking the link because they, although you can sort of see the pictures that are there um, on this, the close-ups, when you can see it on the actual website itself, they are fabulous. And there are also more pictures than I could share on this, including some really beautiful cornicing, um, close-ups of the images, some of the artefacts that have been found. Do check out the image itself. So, where are we? Uh, the top, the picture on the top left of the artifact is i'm just going to double check what i'm seeing here so we have got paris kidnapping helen the helen is the figure who looks like the tallest one in that top image so it's sort of to the pull to the front and to the um for me as i'm looking at it to my left if that makes sense so helen is not the one in the middle i think that's a kind of perspective thing the from what i can see the person in the middle is supposed to be a male figure um and the the person on the left of the image, as far as, as I'm looking at it, is the is the female figure. I believe. It's possible actually the person next to her is also female, but I'm fairly sure that it's Helen is on the outer left side. She seems to be the focus. Happy to be corrected, but it seems to be that, that is who Paris is reaching for across the dog lion. In the middle, the dog lion, maybe. Um, and we've got another article on it here. Uh, these these frescoed dining rooms. So it, we've got, and it says here, the Priestess Cassandra with the god Apollo, who gives her the gift of prophecy. Uh, and then we've got Paris and Helen as well. It's being referred to as the Black Room, and it's in the same structure where a, break, a bakery likely operated using the labour of enslaved workers that has been previously found. Um, it's thought that this building could belong to Aulus Rustius Verus, who is known from official other political propaganda in Pompeii. So he is a very wealthy politician from Pompeii. Doesn't everybody have a dog lion? Well, I'm, I'm cl clearly, I'm lacking the dog lion. 
where's my dog lion? I want a dog lion. Um, as for that, yes, there is a description on it. The description reads, the description beneath the picture, that first picture, reads as follows. Um, so you've got that picture. You've got a tall female figure um, with sort of red hair next to another possibly smaller, possibly female figure. You've got a dog lion in the middle, and then you have got who I assume to be Paris. And what you have here is it says, the frescoes depict Greek mythology. Paris kidnaps Helen, which triggers the Trojan War. It doesn't specify which side in this description, which side Helen is on, whether she's the one on the far left or in the central. And there's no reference to the dog line, which I think is a miss for me. <laughs> I have a chinchilla. <laughs> so, I mean, she thinks she's a dog lion. She thinks she's a honey badger. She is, uh, <laughs> she is ferocious. She is made of ferocity. Oh, is that what that is? It's a crook. Ah, yes. So Paris with his crook. I thought that was a, like a whip. I didn't know what that was in his hand. Um, if anybody can click on the article and can see, I I have no Greek, so I do not know what that what that says. Uh, I think if you can read Greek. If you go to the BBC website and look at the picture, if you are capable of reading and translating Greek, I think it's probably clear enough that you will know what it said. But don't necessarily um, quote me on that. Uh, the link is, it will be number 15 in the description box. So we have got more Roman finds. Um Archaeologists have found a remarkable Roman villa full of coins, jewellery and curse tablets. I, I'm i not a superstitious person. Maybe that's a lie. Maybe I am. I, if, I, if I was on archaeological dig and I found curse tablets, I'd be afraid a little bit, a little bit. So... This has been found in the village of Grove, which is 60 miles west of London. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I have got no idea what where Grove is, but apparently 60 miles west of London. The area had apparently been occupied since the Bronze Age. This complex, though, was built in the Roman era, era and they have several hall-like aisle buildings, which date to the late 1st and 2nd centuries CE. They've also got a, quote, winged corridor villa. Um, the sheer size of the buildings that still survive and the riches of the goods recovered suggest that this was a dominant feature in the locality, if not the wider landscape. The villa had a main hall that connected multiple rooms, likely built before the neighbouring aisle buildings, which were large structures and that they might have been added as the owner's wealth grew. The structures are impressive for their intricate decorations, we're told. They were embellished with painted plaster, mosaics, ornate tile work, colonnades, brick floors and other ornamentations. They found within it a trove of artefacts. They found brooches, rings, coins, tableware and a belt buckle decorated with horses. They think the belt buckle dates to between 350 and 450 CE and it's thought that it belonged to a member of the Roman elite. We are told that the site is far more complex than a regular rural site and clearly was an important centre for activities for a long time, from the Bronze Age to the later Roman period. The residents who actually lived there and their lives do have remain elusive. They don't know where these people ended up. But they do think the complex does contain a burial. They also found 
um, what they're referring to as curious objects that they say help provide clues to the occupant's spiritual practices. They found a, quote, enigmatic assemblage of tightly coiled lead scrolls that resemble Roman curse tablets, scraps of lead the Roman used to write messages to higher powers. The site also reveals several miniature votive axes, which are similar to a collection of miniature weapons they once found in the village of Yuli, thought to have been offered to gods like Mercury. Quote, it's remarkable to think that we are simply in the latest in the line of people who have established a community on this site. Uh, Gio Giana says, are these lead curses from others to the family hidden in the villa or are they curses by the family for others? Question mark. Don't know. Not made clear. Maybe they don't know yet. Perhaps more study will find what's going on here. Um, and if we get some updates, I will let you know. Marianne points out that cursed tablets were quite common and were usually for a specific act or person, um, and also that cursed tablets were more commonly found in temples. So maybe we're going to see some further information that perhaps there was a, a, a temple happening, a, a temple site happening somewhere near, or maybe the manufacture of objects to go to temple. We shall see. A Roman gold hoard is suggesting a Nordic connection to a network of the European elite. The find is suggesting that the village of Vindelev in Yelling, Denmark, likely had connections to a network of European elite. In 2020, one of the largest gold hoards ever found in Denmark was discovered by a metro detectorist. It contains 23 gold objects dating to the migration period during the Germanic Ice Age. So they have got 13 gold bracteates from the 5th century, uh, a granulated gold fitting from a sword or knife, and four mounted Roman medallions from the 4th century AD. Among these bracteates is the largest example ever discovered, <clears throat> and one with a runic inscription that is the earliest known mention of Odin. Researchers examined four Roman medallions, and they now suggest they were included as bride payment or gifts in a, an elite European network. Hele Horsinaz, who is the author of the study, said, quote, we don't have any signs that there was supposed to be a power base in Vindelev, at this time, so it is surprising to find objects that not only show local power but also European connections. This really puts Vindelev on the European map and places the owner at the highest European level. The medallions, we're told, depict four different emperors from the fourth century AD and were likely used as pendants for women. Therefore, it's possible these items were exchanged several times before being passed on the generations of a family in Vindelev. How cool is that? Yes, Steve, you I remember you you went to Yelling to see the runestones last summer. I mean, hopefully the National Museum will be displaying this stuff. Unless it already is. So when you take another trip, maybe you'll see this next time. Archaeologists uncover exquisite Roman glassware in the French city of Nîmes. And I, I think that this is a photograph of the finds. But there's a part of me that's wondering if that's a reconstruction. Because they're so perfect that I'm wondering what's going on there. But Let's carry on. Recent excavations have revealed 
cremation pyres and secondary burials from the 2nd century BCE to the 2nd century CE. There are several pyres, some built out of limestone rubble or terracotta tile stacks, others that were simply dug into the ground. The burials are located in funerary enclosures delimited by walls along the route of the Via Domita. Uh, and a second adjacent road running northeast to southwest. A total of 15 burials have been identified, the majority of which are cremation burials with several inhumation burials. Buried with the deceased are numerous high status grave goods, including strigils, which is uh, one of the tools that are used for cleansing the body, so that kind of oil massage, and then the strigil goes over it, ornate glass vases, ceramics, uh, a glass paste cup, lamps, fragments of funeral monuments, and amphora. The glass vases are being described here as relatively intact. These ones that we're seeing pictured here look to me to be fully intact. So that's why I'm questioning. Are these the vases that have been found or is this some kind of reconstruction? They would have been deposited during feasting rituals known as the refriger refrigerium, a commemorative meal held on the day of burial. This was conducted by female priestesses and consented on the consumption of wine in glass vessels. It hasn't been described as either AI or a reconstruction, but when it describes it as being relatively intact, how can this be anything other than fully intact? Thoughts? Question mark? Um, fabulous, though, isn't it? Uh, next up, we have got another one to add to our legion of child archaeologists. A boy has discovered a 2,000-year-old gold bracelet in a field it, it, near the village of Pagham in West Sussex. 12-year-old Rowan Brannan, who looks very pleased with himself, and rightly so, have discovered a Roman cuff bracelet dating back to the 1st century CE. It has been identified as an armilla type cuff bracelet that would have been awarded to Roman soldiers for acts of valour and service. These are considered prestigious military decorations. The coroner has found this to be a treasure, unsurprisingly. Um, and Rowan, his, Rowan's mum has said that he's always been into finding all sorts of bits and pieces. I'm forever saying, put it down, it's dirty. A phrase I've used myself and I may have to stop using. But on this occasion, he kept holding this bit of metal, convinced it was actual real gold. A, Initially mistaken for, for debris, Rowan's persistence led to the realisation of this treasure's true value. True value. Uh, he researched methods to confirm the authenticity of his find, and with the assistance of a visiting hairdresser interested in metal detecting, they took the necessary steps to verify the object. They then contacted a fines the Asian officer to report their discovery. Further analysis of the brace at the British Museum and a thorough examination in the coroner's court shed light on its historical significance. His mum said, it's been brilliantly fascinating. We've learned so many things and it's quite lovely to still be involved so we can follow its story. Um, in accordance with regulation, the discovery has been reported to local fire liaison officer and the coroner's court. If you fail to do that, then the the treasure these would and it's deemed to be treasure that can result in criminal prosecution so uh if you find something in the dirt or your child does then you know make sure you tell somebody suzanne never prevent kids from playing in the dirt sometimes in london there's dirt and then there's dirt. You have to be. You have to. You have to my my phrase at the moment is "Don't lick that." To to all of you, but also to my three year old Lorcan. Don't put that in your mouth. You've no idea where it's been. Look, don't lick the history. I have to tell my son to stop licking the window. He thinks it's hilarious, particularly if there's somebody outside or inside. He wants to lick the window. He thinks it's funny. And me going, "Ah, dirty," only makes him cackle like a drain. I'm constantly being trolled by my child, <laughs> whose current favourite thing is to walk up to me, pretend he wants to kiss me, and then just lick my face. <laughs> Who 
<laughs> You've heard of the five second rule. This is the 2000 year old rule. Look, <laughs> don't lick the history. Don't lick the fines. I'm shaking my hair at you. Don't lick the history. <laughs> we see squeeze box. You need a baby cage. That is adorable. That is, it's adorable you think that would work. When we put my son in a crib, which is, I'm aware, the dumb thing, and he would fall asleep and I'd put him in his crib. So sweet. And then he would wake up and he would scream like he was on fire. So it was so bad that I sold the crib. And I bought a floor bed instead, which was perfect because now we don't get the screaming like he's on fire at three in the morning, which is very disturbing. However, it does mean that he is at liberty to come and harass us because he's not caged. You can't cage that child. You can't cage that child. Time to stop cleaning the windows. It's cute that you think he wouldn't just like the extra spice. <laughs> mm, spicy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Are our kids' dogs or smart asses? Column A, column B. Um, when he's being cheeky, he sometimes pretends to pant at me like a dog. Um, he has been known to bark at me. It's good times. It's good times. <laughs> Most of the time, he's just quoting various. TV shows and films and Tonys that he's that he's got. If you've got a small human in your vicinity who loves stories, I heartily recommend a Tony box. We're having a great time with ours. And what's fabulous about it is that they do have like, I just thought it was going to be for little kiddies, but they ha have things um, all the way up, things produced by like National Geographic for older children. I think they go up to like eight or nine. Um, so... They are they are great. If you've got if you've got a child that needs entertaining, I think a Tony box is a way to go. And also, the cool thing is that you can um, you can get these ones called creative Tonys, and you can ask like friends or maybe grandparents or aunts and uncles. Perhaps they don't see them very much. You could ask them to record messages that you can then put on the creative Tony. So you could like get them to maybe read a story or something. I think that's a really sweet thing to do. That's our plan anyway. Anne, leave the licking to the professionals. This is a family show. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> For free on the internet. I do not think so. Yeah, my husband, one of the things I did is I downloaded to our creative Tony... Um, the 25 language version of Let It Go because that's my son's favourite. Um, it's a line from 25 different languages. And I th I think he's learnt them all. So every now and again, he's singing Let It Go and you think, you think to yourself he's singing Let It Go and then you're like, oh no, this is the 25 language version. Alicia uses a leapfrog learning pad. I'll have to look into those. Cool. <laughs> Lorcan's nephew uh, used to lick produce in the supermarket. <laughs> You'd look away and he'd be off licking apples. <laughs> it's like he knew a run off the stealth lick. <laughs> Oh dear, kids, they're great. They they are they are <laughs> they are your reward for the child you were. <laughs> it's what I'm learning. <laughs> oh, good times. So we've got. I always pronounce this word because there's like, is it Byzantine, Byzantine, or Byzantine, or something else? One of those, recycled one of those, silver, drove 7th century trade. 
This is a report in Cosmos magazine. Lead isotope analysis of coins minted in what is now England, the Netherlands and parts of France between 660 and 77, 660 and 750 CE indicates they were made from recycled Byzantine, Byzantine or Byzantine silver. This is suggesting that trade between Northwestern Europe and this empire began earlier than previously thought. We've got, again, elites, those travelling elites. Elites in England and Francia were almost certainly sitting on this silver already. It's thought they were melted down when a king or lord needed cash, and uh, the resulting currency fueled trade around the North Sea in the 7th century. Coins mentioned in England in the mid-8th century under Offa, King of Mercia, were probably made from the of silver from the Melee mine in what's now France. As ruler of the Carolingian Empire, Charlemagne exported melee silver throughout northwestern Europe. You can read, if you click on this one, you can read the uh, this article in uh, antiquity. And to find about, there's also stuff about oh, Byzantine, Byzantine, Byzantine coins that have been uncovered in Israel. There's a link to that too. As titles go, <laughs> Carrot Harvest helped to discover a hoard of ancient coins. So, once again, if you are looking for... <laughs> my husband's just reminded me about a thing <laughs> that my son does. If... You, if you let him get close to the pizzas in Asda, the ones that come on the tray, he'll bite them. <laughs> You've got to, got to catch him before he's given them all a little nibble, all a little nibble. <laughs> um, Aurora, he loves the Lion King and weirdly... He loves Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, which of all of the sequels is it's not good. They they uh, it's not got the same qualities as Lion King. Um, he started he claims to like the Little Mermaid, but he's not seen the Little Mermaid. So I don't quite know why that is. Um I'm going to try and get him onto the to uh, Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. I think he will like Aladdin because the songs are banging. Um, but he's very much he very much likes what he likes, uh, and he also loves the Julia Donaldson cartoons. So we cycle through Gruffalo, Gruffalo's Child, Sick Man, Zog, Room on the Broom. Oh, he loves Room on the Broom. So, Be Beverly, Bluey is fun for all the family. We, in fact, took him to the Bluey Christmas show at the South Bank Centre, and he had the time of his life. Time of his life. Shane, he loves Elsa. He loves Frozen. I will never... I think... I'm very pleased that currently all of my son's heroes, they're all female. Bluey, Moana, Elsa. He just, he, they are all his favourite superheroes. And I love that. And yes, I am saying that both Elsa and Moana are superheroes because, and so is Bluey, right? Bluey's a talking dog superhero. Elsa, snow magic. Moana controls the sea. He's very excited as well to, to know that Moana 2 is coming out. Um, at one time, we thought it was coming out on my husband's birthday. It's now coming out a bit later. So uh, frequently, my son has gone, Daddy, is it nearly your birthday? <laughs> he doesn't care about Daddy's birthday. <laughs> he doesn't care about Daddy's birthday. <laughs> um, so Carrot Harvest helped a Tetris find a hoard of ancient coins. 
Um, <laughs> my husband wants to show my son Peaky Blinders. Uh, I caught him the other day teaching. J Jamie's turned to Gabriel and he goes, no fighting, no fighting. And I'm about to jump in and he's changed the word to no flipping fighting. But now, of course, my son says that. And everybody who's seen Peaky Blinders knows what the original line is. <laughs> We're getting caught up at the school so much when that kid starts school. It's going to be unreal. Unreal. Um, so it, proof, once again, if ever you needed it, that if you want to get a mesh detector, now is the time. But, of course, do your detectoring responsibly. So this, uh, a medieval ring found in a farmer's field. Alan Baxter knew after finding it, there must be other ancient artifacts nearby. But there was stubble from the thick oat crop that made it hard for him to find it. Um, so he waited. Then the farmer planted carrots. And so that was a different kettle of fish. There was apparently a deep plough to get the carrots, to lift them, and so he could get right to the soil. He says, every three feet, I was getting a signal, there was stuff everywhere. He, These are coins. He found 52 over a course of a few weeks. As it points out, detectorists do need to ask permission from landowners, and they also have to hand all of their fines or report their fines to the appropriate authorities. Uh, under Scottish law, all fines of archaeological, historical, cultural significance must be reported and can be claimed by the Crown. Fines that are allocated to the museum through the treasure trove system are usually acknowledged by an award paid to the detectorist that is then normally split with the landowner. So we can just sort of see that the fines that have been made. Um, Incredible finds here. This fine was allocated to the National Museums of Scotland and £5,000 was paid out. He has also found 69 medieval coins from the reign of the English King Edward I, um, who, whose armies invaded Scotland at the end of the 13th century. The medieval ring, which was his first find on the Fife site, dates between the 13th and 14th century. He apparently thought it was a bottle top at first. Um, But instead, it's now thought to be a betrothal ring, probably belonging to the, a high status individual, weighing in at 9.5 grams. It's a silver ring that's been coated in, in gold. He's also, Mr. Bax has also written a book called Making History My Life as a Scottish Metrotectorist. Um, so if you want to know more about metal detectoring then that's a book to check out i'd imagine it is called once again the author being alan baxter and the title is M making history my life as a scottish metal detectorist um shane i am a self-confessed timmy my mum got caught at school all the time because i when i knew a thing i would just i'm such a gossip and I, I saw something about um, essentially all people who are into history, what we secretly are is we're just gossips. We're gossiping about the past. Um, and so I think when you're a, a history loving child, that bleeds into other parts of your life. So when you know a thing, you want to share a thing. And sometimes that thing is not supposed to be shared with other three year olds. Uh, the problem is that my son is the carbon copy of me. Everything he does, where I'm like, well, that's going to be a problem. I know it's going to be a problem because I did it. <laughs> he is all my fault. <laughs> and I love that. But I also know <laughs> that there's going to be problem. <laughs> uh, Coco, yeah. Imagine giving your betrothed a really nice ring for some dude to pull it out of the ground and go, let's go bottle top. Rude. Rude. Um, more coins found this time in Sweden. This is an excavation at the historic Brahe Church, which is off of Sweden's southern coast. They found two graves thought to be 800 years old. 
one holding the remains of a man thought to have died between the ages of 20 and 25. Um, these are said to be Christian graves, or rather, the archaeologists said that Christian graves in this time period usually don't contain any artifacts. However, some 170 silver coins that were minted between 1150 and 1180 were recovered. So I'm assuming that this is a Christian burial with unusual artifacts, these coins found inside. Apparently, some of these coins are unique examples. They are being analysed while the excavation at the site continues on. So when we have more information, I shall share it. Archaeologists were looking for a medieval hermitage. hermitage. They found instead a monumental prehistoric henge. These henges, they're always hopping up here, there and everywhere. Around 700 CE, St. Guthlac, son of a nobleman, gave up a life of riches to live in solitude as a Christian monk. He spent two years at a monastery, left to live as a, home, a hermit in Crowland, which I think is also potentially pronounced Croyland, a town in Lincolnshire, England, today. Others had apparently previously tried and failed to settle the area, which was said to be haunted by evil spirits and demons. However, Guthlach established a hermitage there. He lived there until his death in 714. And for years, they have tried to find the location of this hermitage. They started excavating a field between 2021 and 2022. Uh, rather than finding this, they found the remains of an older monumental prehistoric henge measuring uh, nearly 250 feet across. It was constructed during the Neolithic or Early Bronze Age, so between 3000 and 1600 BCE. So they are pronouncing it Coco. They are they are spelling it Crowland. However, there is it's also the Crowland or Croyland Chronicle. So spelled C R O Y L A N D. This is the I believe the same place but alternate spellings. And you may have come across the Croyland Chronicle that connects the things and stories from the Wars of the Roses. So this is a, a double up, double up, if you will. It's They point out that a monument of this scale suggests that this was an important ceremonial centre and a focal point in the late prehistoric era. In prehistoric times, the Henge would have formed a large circular enclosed space with a huge bank and ditch running around the outside, with perhaps one or more burial mounds built inside it during the Bronze Age. After a long period of abandonment, the Henge's interior was reoccupied during Guthlach's lifetime. They have found numerous artefacts there, a pottery, bone combs, fragments of glass and a drinking vessel. Um, the hedge remains would have been visible at that time and researchers think the site's long history could have appealed to figures like Guthlach. In the 12th century, the abbots of Crowland constructed a hall and a chapel complex at the site, which were also uncovered during the recent digs. This chapel might have been dedicated to St Pega, Guthlach's sister, who was also a venerated hermit. What have your parents got to do? <laughs> what have your parents got to do that two of their kids, son and daughter, were like, nah, <laughs> deuces, I'm going to I'm gonna foxtrot Oscar <laughs> and live as a hermit. See you, Mum. See you, Dad. That is some special parenting. Quote, we know that many prehistoric monuments were reused by the Anglo-Saxon, but to find a henge, especially one that was previously unknown, occupied in this way is really quite rare. So as and when more things come out about it, I will, of course, update you. Next up, imagine finding this <laughs> in your house. So you're in your bathroom um, and you're scrubbing your lav. And then you find a trapdoor and you open this trapdoor and you see a face <laughs> with a great gaping hole for the mouth. I would immediately need to use the toilet. <laughs> immediately. Um, this is a carving of the Lincoln imp. 
thought to be part of an elaborate drape dating from the mid to late 14th century. Mr. Vorster said, I couldn't believe it. I shouted up to my wife and said, I found a thing, which I'm sorry <laughs> if your spouse is in the toilet and shouts to you, darling, I found a thing. You're like, oh, it's happening. <laughs> Here we go. Um, they said the discovery is an example of why Lincoln is amazing. She said, you look at the outside of the house and that's historical enough. But now to find something inside is amazing. Uh, the previous occupant had been here for 20 years. Surely they knew, but we had absolutely no clue it was here. This house is located in a place called Vicar's Court in Minster Yard, close to Lincoln's Cathedral. And it was used by priests in the 13th century. Apparently the uh, <laughs> whole house has a kind of hollow walling. So immediately the th thought is there could be more. In fact, we're almost certain now. This is how, this is how you end up pulling down all the plasterboard in your house. This is how, this is how you get on a, on a wild hair and end up gutting your interior. <laughs> oy, 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 oy. <clears throat> so, Hopping forward to the late 16th century, and the research now points to uh, Shakespeare having played a jealous husband in a Ben Jonson drama. We do know, of course, that Shakespeare was an actor, and he's referred to as being the greatest dramatist of all time. I mean, other playwrights did exist. And while I might have a love for Shakespeare, I am also partial to a bit of Johnson and particularly to a soupçon of Marlowe. I think Marlowe is a beautiful playwright. Anyway, we're not going to get into that right now. They claim it's the greatest dramatist of all time. Questions. Um, a leading scholar has concluded from linguistic analysis that Shakespeare played an obsessively jealous husband in a play by Ben Jonson. He has discovered striking similarities between phrases recited by Thorello in Every Man and His Humour and those in Shakespeare's Othello, Hamlet and Twelfth Night. He told The Guardian, quote, what I found some really interesting connections in terms of language, which suggests that Shakespeare was perhaps unconsciously remembering his own lines. This is, you know, this is one of the things that I've always um, incredibly panicked about when I am... Um, researching and writing scripts for this because obviously I love history so I've read loads of history books right um and I've also watched lots of historical documentaries and so there's always times when I think I I'm, I'm always panicked that I've written something and I'm going to go I think it's my terminology and I'm always worried that actually it's somebody else's that I've heard and absorbed. These things do happen. You do kind of get those sort of brain wormy bits, don't you? Um, as it points out, uh, Elizabeth and actors aren't normally given the entire script. They certainly aren't. They're given their player sheet and the cues to it. So you have to stay very alert uh, during your performance, to make sure that you're not going to miss your cue. The so Freebury Jones points out that in Johnson's play, you've got Bianca, unfortunate wife of the jealous Torello, who suspects she's having an affair. She says, For God's sake, sweetheart, come in out of the air. To which Torello responds with an aside, How simple and how subtle are her answers. In Hamlet, Polonius asks, Will you walk out of the air, my lord? To which Hamlet responds, Into my grave. Polonius says, Indeed, that's out of the air. He then offers an aside how pregnant sometimes his replies are. The corresponding instructions and similarities in context are striking. In this case of Shakespeare remember, is this a case of Shakespeare remembering one of his cue lines and an aside? That's really interesting. And it's, of course, it's very possible, I think. Um, he points out that Shakespeare also remembered Sorello's line, they would give out because my wife is fair, when he depicted... Othello's destructive jealousy. It is not to make me jealous to say my wife is fair. So Shakespeare's inverting Thoreau's comic jealousy in his similarly named tragic protagonist, Othello. 
We, of course, know that Shakespeare acted in his own plays. Um, for example, it's suggested he played the role of the ghost of Hamlet's father. He may also have played the role of Adam in As You Like It, etc., etc. These discoveries are going to be part of an upcoming book called Shakespeare's Borrowed Feathers, How Early Modern Playwrights Shaped the World's Greatest Writers. I think that's going to be a really interesting book. And it's... For me, it's the thing when when we talk about the Shakespeare authorship question and there is this consideration or conspiracy theory that the works of Shakespeare were written by another and that Shakespeare was a pseudonym. Um, and I think that, that that comes out a lot because of the sheer size of the canon created. However, when we think about collaboration, when we think about adaptation, then all of a sudden we perhaps have, to my mind anyway, a more interesting conversation to have. Who is inspiring Shakespeare? Who is he um, referencing? Who is he perhaps plagiarising? And and how acceptable is that? So I, I think that's I think that's very interesting. It's very interesting to me anyway, and I'm looking forward to checking out Shakespeare's Borrowed Feathers. And uh, yes, I will I will see if I can get hold of that book. A Dorset couple have found a 17th century treasure, a hoard of it, while renovating their kitchen. Once again, don't... <laughs> this is not your cue to start digging up bits of your house just because somebody found a creepy face and these have found a, a treasure trove, it doesn't mean that you're going to find one. Although if you do, congratulations. Um, Time Lord boy, I do agree. He nicked plays from other people. I think it's that kind of when you see something that works, and it's not just plays, of course, You, you the the Italianate text that he he clearly has access to somebody's library. <clears throat> um, he, I think, has connections, certainly to the Earl of Essex. We know that um, to Oxford. Uh, so he has access to people who have libraries. He's clearly got access to Hollinshed's Chronicles. Um, he's evidently got access to a lot of Italian literature, possibly in translation, but he is friends with translators like John Florio. So he has a network of people that he is talking to and working with. He is referencing classical, the classical literature from his grammar school education, but he's also referencing what's working in and around him. You know, he, he sees that Thomas Kidd's ultraviolence is popular, and so he has a go at Tysodronicus and then takes his foot off the gas there. He, you know, he's clearly influenced by people like Johnson and Marlowe in the themes he puts forward, in sometimes the characters he presents, and he's also referencing literature as well. Yeah, you have to get inspiration from somewhere. And I, I often think there's elements when we when we talk about Shakespeare is that it's like Oliver exclamation mark, the musical theatre show, and Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens are inherently different texts, clearly. But one is very obviously inspired by the other. And it still creates, it still requires a massive amount of creativity and artistry to take Oliver Twist and create Oliver exclamation mark. There we go, Julesy. <laughs> there we are. You were there. Great minds think you like. Absolutely. Yes. But yes. Um, and here we go. Julesy again. DIY not. Don't DIY it. <laughs> Get your mesh detector out first. So anyway, these lovely um <laughs> Husband, my husband is just texting me of Shakespeare to say he reworks Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> he is, it's not just me that's the button pusher, clearly, because we sat down to watch Sons of Anarchy and I watched the first, I think, 
15 minutes and I went, oh, it's Hamlet. It's Hamlet. <laughs> and that's the thing is, of course, Hamlet has been reworked into uh, 10 Things I Hate About You and West Side Story and The Lion King and uh, Sons of Anarchy and pff, you name it. Uh, so here we go. This uh, kitchen renovation in Dorset, they have found more than a 1,000 17th century coins. Betty and Robert Fuchs were removing the kitchen's concrete floor to create more ceiling height at their farmhouse when they found a smashed glazed pottery bowl full of 400-year-old coins. Um, yes, I, 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 yes. So 10 Things I Hate About You is based on Tamey the Shrew, West Side Story, Romeo and Juliet. I'm, I'm saying that Shakespeare has been reworked and rewritten. So... Lion King is Hamlet. Sons of Anarchy is Hamlet. Um, the one about the uh, Spacey plays the president. That's Macbeth. So yeah, I, I meant I did mean Shakespeare more generally. Has been reworked uh, countless times in countless ways. So. One evening, we're told, I was with the children and my husband was digging with a pickaxe when he called to say they found something. What is it with you? Darling, I've found a thing. <laughs> um, he put all the coins in a bucket. If we hadn't lowered the floor, they would still be hidden there. The thought process being that at one time the person tried to find them uh, and would, would have come back for them but didn't get the chance for whatever. Um Manda, Battlestar Galactica. It's, is that the Tempest? No. Hmm. Battlestar Galactica. What Shakespeare is that reworking? I love Battlestar Galactica as well. I haven't seen June. Is that related to a Shakespeare? Should I do a video on like what m kind of more contemporary shows are um, are based on Shakespeare's? Or well, haven't seen Forbidden Planet? Forbidden Planet with Tempest was it? Okay. Should I do something? Should I do something like contemporary versions of Shakespeare's? Would that be good? I'm going to have to update my film knowledge, I think, quite a bit. Because, yeah, I know June is based on a book, but is the book of June based on something earlier as well? EastEnders is mostly based on the things that clearly therapists have had to help to deal with, with very dysfunctional families and couples. Okay, I will investigate and see what I can find out about um, various Shakespeare adaptations. Lizzie B. Uh, oh, hang on. You've jumped. You've jumped there. Sorry. Uh, Lizzie B. Don't have membership here on YouTube. I don't, <clears throat> mostly because I think potentially the value of, of offering a membership, if, please correct me if I'm wrong, and the value of offering a membership would be that I was prepared to put some content behind a paywall. And that is something that from the start of my channel, long before I even thought I'd ever get monetized, that was something that was very clear I didn't want to do. So I I don't see why anybody would want to pay for a membership when I'm not going to put any content behind a paywall. Um, if I'm if I'm wrong about the value of a membership to people, do let me know. Because if it's something people want for some reason where I'm not going, but I'm not going to put content behind a paywall for this channel. If I do courses on my website, that'd be slightly different. But um, let me let me know if if there's something that I've that I've missed.
Gandalf Cow. Absolutely, yes. Lion King is Hamlet and Lion King 2 is Romeo and Juliet. It is. It is. Um, Peg says, don't forget the Japanese movies. Okay. My cinema knowledge is very, like, I, like, Disney as a kid and The Princess Bride and then musicals. That's what I was raised on. Kiss Me Kate is based on the Tame of the Shrew. Absolutely. Um, Manda, membership lets you get emotes and things like that. Okay. I mean, if it's, I, I get something I could, I could, I could enable it um, for like a bargain basement thing, I suppose. I have to look into this. I could add it. Absolutely no pressure. But if it's something that people want because you can do emotes with it, if that's something that people would find valuable, I'm happy to enable it. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to put things behind a paywall. So if people still want to do a membership, knowing that nothing's going to be behind the paywall, I'm happy to just click a button. That's fine for me. Um, so yeah, let me know if you want me to do that. Um, this hoard was found in 2019. It apparently contains coins from James the First and Charles the First. Ah, Jesse. Maybe Jamie can look into it fully. Can you hear that he's he's on the he's watching this? Um, Jamie, minion, <laughs> you there, boy? Um, <laughs> look into it. Look into it. Uh, see if uh, these memberships could be of, of value and use, and it supports us like a Patreon. Because I always thought Patreon is is to produce extra content behind a paywall, which I never wanted to do. Um, so they've got Charles the James the first and Charles the first gold coins, silver half crowns, uh, shillings and sixpences, and then they've also got silver shillings and sixpences from the reigns of Elizabeth the first, Philip and Mary. So very interesting. My husband's a very big film buff, so I'm sure that he can help me out with uh, this Shakespeare hunt as well. So. They this modern concrete floor was removed and they dug down nearly two foot to provide greater height. And in some areas, there were old flagstones under the concrete, but the area the coins were found was bare earth. These coins have now been sent to the British Museum for identification and cleaning, and they think the coins were all deposited on one occasion. So these are now going to be auctioned. The auction is going to take place tomorrow, 23rd of April, and it's expected that these will. The coin hoard will fetch £35,000. That's probably going to cover the kitchen renovation. This one's very interesting. Now, if you, <coughs> trigger warning, if you click on this article in the description box stuff, what has been cut out in between the title and the article body is the uh, skull. So there, there are human remains in this. So don't click that if you don't see it. But Archaeologists have found an, what they are calling an exceptional prosthesis made of gold, silver and wool that helped an 18th century man with a cleft palate live his life. This is a 300-year-old device found in Poland. When you have a cleft palate today, they will usually, they will take either a bit of bone, I believe from the hip. I had a friend at school who had a cleft palate. Um, so they take it, they graft a bit of bone so they can um, seal the cleft and the hard palate. It's thought that this is the first such discovery, not only in Poland, but also in Europe. We are told that no such device exists in institutional private collections, Polish and foreign. It's a 1.2 inch long or 3.1 centimetre prosthesis known as a palatal obturator. It weighs about 0.2 of an ounce, 5.5 grams. And this is part of a study that was published in April in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports. And it's a wooden pad sewn into a metallic plate. A woolen pad sewn into a metallic plate. 
interesting. This was found in the crypt of the Church of St. Francis of Assisi in Krakow during an excavation from 2017 to 2018. It was buried in the jaws of a man who had a cleft palate, according to a physical examination and a CT scan of his remains. When they removed the prosthesis, they noticed that the, a fibre pad that they later identified as wool wore, bore specks of yellow, probably gold, and green, probably copper, which were unintentionally removed during the conservation process. It's thought the wool pad was covered with a thin sheet of copper and then gold to help prevent infections by blocking secretions that could soak into the fabric. That's really interesting. It's They don't know how well it would have fitted or how tight a seal it would have provided, but it is said that modern-day patients who are struggling with similar health problems describe the use of this prosthesis as something that helps to improve speech and also to help them with comfort when eating. How incredible is that? We've also got a story about shipwrecked plates found on the seafloor that are now going to auction. These are 12 porcelain plates in Shepherd's Great Irish Interior Sale that's going. It's happening on the 30th of April. These are blue and white paint plates that are thought to go for between 2,000 to 3,000 euros, made in China in around 1750, decorated with peonies and pomegranate blossom, which designates them as being created for the export market. As this rightly points out, 18th century Europe was absolutely avid for porcelain. Like silver, furniture, paintings and carpets, it was an essential part of home decor. These plates were packed into crates of tea, which protected the delicate porcelain when the ship hit a coral reef and sank in the South China Sea. The 32 surviving crew members were strongly suspected of salvaging the gold from the sinking ship and, highlight, and then hiding it. <clears throat> so according to the company records, this cargo included 171 dinner services, 63,623 teacups and saucers, 19,535 coffee cups and saucers, 14,315 dinner plates, uh, 1,452 soup plates, um, 299 cuspidors or spittoons, 606 vomit pots, lovely, 75 fish bowls, 447 single dishes, 1,000 nests of round dishes, and 25,921 slot bowls and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> uh, this remained on the, on the floor of the sea for 233 years. In 1984, 23,000 pieces of porcelain were salvaged and it was sold in a landmark auction in Christie's Amsterdam. And then archaeologists have also complained about the excavations that went on. They referred to it as a smash and grab methodology, destroying the context of the wreck in the haste to extract the valuables for rapid resale. People are fretting about the ethics of extraction, but then in the 80s, the public were beguiled by tales of sunken treasure and the romance of the shipwreck story. The plates at Shepherds were purchased at Christie's by an Irish investment banker for 9,000 Dutch guilders. That's around 4,500 euros. He kept the receipt. The plates are barnacle free and don't they spent several centuries at the bottom of the sea. Uh, the same collector made a boss, another possibly wiser investment for Japanese woodblock prints by Hiroshi Yoshida that were included in the sale. The signed prints are from Yoshida's Seto Inland Sea Series. So it's a sailing boat at different times of day. So these are on these are on sale, and we'll see what they reach. However, we do have some questions about whether or not they should have been excavated the way they were. We shall see. Excavations at Sheffield Castle, which was used to house Mary Queen of Scots. 
um, having it was constructed during the following the Norman Conquest, and it was also the place where Mary Queen of Scots was imprisoned. The two of archaeologists have now found a in the industrial heritage of Sheffield during excavations. When the modern concrete foundations were removed, along with the backfield deposits, they have found traces of structures from the 19th century. They found the remnants of a vaulted ceiling, which is thought to be a crucible furnace. This is a foundry furnace used for the melting of casting, melting and casting of metals like steel. And they've also got rakeout pits below the furnace. Wessex archaeology says, quote, this cellar would have been a hot, unpleasant place when the crucible furnaces were working, reaching temperatures of 12,000 degrees centigrade. The firing process was hot and efficient, but it also produced lots of ash, which needed to be cleared. Uh, the ash would fall into the rake out pits below where a worker, perhaps a young boy, had the back-breaking job of removing it. From now until May 2024, the community of Sheffield is being invited to experience and discover the site's archaeology firsthand. They've got open days and opportunities to participate in the excavation for a day. The attendance is free. And if you want to book, though, you see it's free, but you do need to book. If you go to www.wessexarch, so all one word, wessexarch.com, .co.uk forward slash events, then you can book your place and take part in some of those excavations. We have got modernising the hunt for Scotland's buried treasure. Apps and new technology, we're told, could help to modernise the search for buried treasure in Scotland. We have learnt a lot about the boom in popularity of metal detecting. Uh, that put the current treasure trove system under pressure with more and more people submitting their finds. The treasure trove unit is what decides whether these should be offered to a museum and then they pay out the financial reward. It has been suggested that an app could help by allowing detectorists to submit their finds for a quick initial assessment. The aim being streamlining and modernising using all the tools that are available in the present day to get this done as quickly, as efficiently as possible. Recent finds in Scotland have included a mesolithic harpoon, mento mori finger rings adorned with a human skeleton, and a hoard of coins near Peebles, which could date to 1150 BCE. We've got here uh, some Iron Age gold torques found near Stirling. Aren't they beautiful? The National Council for Metal Detecting has 1,600 members. Uh, there was a rise in um, numbers during the COVID pandemic, which I suppose it was a way to get out not long afterwards and meet people in, in relative safety. Uh, they also have magnet fishing, of course, as well. The We've got here all of the people that are finding all sorts of things coins from the 14th century we've got this is the mesolithic era harpoon that we're seeing that image of the spiky thing towards the right um so hopefully there there's a treasure trove review being carried out on behalf of the crown representative of scotland the king's and the lord treasurer's remembrancer and there's going to be a public consultation on the review that's going to close on the 13th of May. But I think using the use of apps is a really good idea, personally. Um, of course, it's going to come, there's going to be always upsides and downsides, but anything that can potentially streamline this process, uh, I think can only be a good thing. This one was weird for me. This is this is completely news to me, that there are, there's a movement to remove Renoir from the museums. In 2015, a group of protesters picketed outside the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. They were demanding to remove the works of Renoir from the walls of this gallery. They, their reasoning being that Renoir was bad at art. 
The Renoir sucks at painting movement was the brainchild of Max Geller and came to life after he encountered the sizable collection of Renoir paintings at Philadelphia's Barnes Foundation. Armed with, <laughs> this is a quote from the article, armed with snobbish hit to fury and signage that reads, God hates Renoir and re no are, and we're not iconoclasts, Renoir just sucks at painting. The group received uh, considerable media attention. This completely passed me by in 2015. Uh Though none, so the, it got media attention, but nobody from the institutions paid any. Fellow Renoir haters expressed their aesthetic sympathy online by posting photographs of themselves giving their middle finger to Renoir. Julesy, this is not the ding dong. <laughs> this is not the ding dong. I, I am utterly baffled by this. Like, if you don't like it, okay, you're entitled. It's, you're entitled for it not to be your taste, but. I think anybody getting this angry about this, are you all right, babe? <laughs> are you all right, babe? Apparently there's, there's a hashtag, hashtag Renoir sucks at paintings. Um, Lizzie B, where is the art of the person critiquing Renoir? I have yet to see it. Yet to see it. Renoir's great-great-granddaughters waded in. Um, Genevieve Renoir, she has argued the free market has clearly spoken in favour of ancestors' talents. The market said something that sounded like $78 million at Sotheby's <laughs> for Baldwin Moulin de Galette. na 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 na, -na. <laughs> uh, Geller, who hates Renoir, responded by saying the free market latched judgment and taste, <laughs> citing TV commercials, climate change, and the destruction of sea otter habitats as evidence. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that Geller probably needs to eat a pie and get laid. <laughs> so weird. This is so weird. Uh, the deeper purpose of Redmore sucks at paintings, one that was generally lost between the media noise and pithy takedowns, Geller wasn't trying to censor Renoir through ridicule. He was hoping to force museums into reconstruct, reconsidering the artistic merits of the paintings on their walls and to make change ideally in favour of non-white male painters. He called it a cultural justice, in which case, ask for that. Like, I get people protest in various ways, but singling out Renoir, if you want a more diverse museum, totally laudable, totally on board with that crack on but you've lost that message in this noise um apparently people have long hated Renoir I was unaware I've got to say I have no firm feelings about Renoir neither one way nor t'other but apparently people have long hated Renoir the loathing has both moral and aesthetic substance on moral grounds Renoir's innumerable, dumb-faced, unflattering female nudes have seen him posthumously charged with sexism. Uh, adding to the ignominy was his anti-Semitism, as shown by his stance in the Dreyfus Affair, which I honestly had no idea about. Yet even the aesthetic charges are somewhat personal. Renoir, a ceramicist by training, fell in love with a Parisian clique that included Alfred Sisley and Claude Monet. Um, the problem was that Renoir quite liked the old things. I'm of the 18th century, he once said, and when times got financially tough, he backtracked and began painting saccharine bourgeois portraits. It made him rich, an international star even. In short, he's seen as a sellout. Critics say that Renoir paid no attention to line or composition. He painted, painted as though on a pot the charge runs. I don't know what that means. Um, he ignored the contemporary concerns of his day. Most damning, seemingly, is that Renoir's paintings are pretty. Good art, of course, can simply cannot simply be pretty. Okay. Um, 
We're also told, for some reason, that one fan of Renoir's Pretty Little Paintings is Donald Trump. He claims to own two sisters on a terrace. We're told it's a fake, mind you. I had no idea that Renoir was so problematic or triggering for some people. Um, I'd... Shannon Forsyth, who made up the rule that art simply can't be pretty? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Um, probably people who can't paint. <laughs> I'd imagine. I'd imagine. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Boom. <laughs> um, I think it's odd. I'll be honest. I, I, this was absolutely when I saw. I had to double check that this wasn't put out on April the first. I, I thought this is. Um, I was, I was very confused. Anyway. This is the last of the pure news news. Now it's the new news news that may be ding dong adjacent. So I'm going to bring out my little ding dong bell. Ding dong bell. Um, and let's see if you think this is a new news or a ding dong. A German art museum has fired a worker for hanging his own painting in the gallery. I kind of enjoyed the chutzpah. Um, but this is... According to the quote, commonly, if wrongly attributed to the artist Andy Warhol, everyone will have their 15 minutes of fame. At Munich's Pinakothek de Moderne Museum earlier this year, one technician and aspiring artist got to bask in the limelight for a whole eight hours. This is a museum in southern Germany, and it confirmed they'd fired one of their technical services team. Does that mean computers? Anyway, um, after it was found to have hung, he's hung one of his own paintings in the gallery dedicated to modern and contemporary art, which allowed him to share space with works by pop art pioneer Warhol for an entire day. It's a 51-year-old man who smuggled his work into the display at Munich's museum, quote, in the hope of achieving his artistic breakthrough. He considers himself an artist and most likely saw his role in the museum installation team as a day job to support his true calling. Oh, so the technician thing, he... I don't know why it's a technician. Okay. Um. <laughs> Is it better than a Renoir, though? Well, I don't know because I didn't see the painting. Um, he did have access to the gallery space outside of opening hours. And he installed his 60 centimetre by 120 centimetre artwork on an empty white wall in a passageway in the Eastern Wing's first floor gallery. That is not... That is not subtle. That is over a metre in height or length. Oh, boy. That's that's a spicy. Um, it happened on the 23rd of February, and it was not made public until the Monday. The decision was apparently made to keep the picture on display while the gallery was open and then take it down after closing time. They would not comment on the painting subject or style to... Uh, not encourage copycat pranksters. All I can say is that we did not receive any positive feedback on the addition from visitors to the gallery. Oh, bless. Um, he, the contract has been terminated. Police are apparently investigating the aspiring modern master because in order to hang his, his painting, he allegedly drilled two holes in the gallery wall. So they have filed a criminal complaint for willful damage to property of the wall. Um, I don't know. Is this ding dong? Is Do we think this is a ding dong? Uh, <laughs> we could class it as a happening. I like that. Um, how do you smuggle that in? It's an excellent question, Scarlett. Uh, excellent question. Julesy says that is a giant ding dong. You're on the ding dong side. Uh, Banks, he's following the footsteps of Banksy. Time Lord calls it a ding dong. Um, my husband thinks the museum's response is ding dong. Um, the, 
Jesse says the painting is really well. We don't know because they won't show us because they don't want copycat pranksters. There's a lot of people saying a ding dong, a ding dong with chachones. Um, I, I like I like the chutzpah. Um, I think it's I think it's of the things that one could do. I think it's a fairly harmless shenanigan to have going on in an exhibition space, but uh. So that was, I don't know, a lot of you seem to think it's a ding-dong. So we can keep it as a, I'm, I'm pleased I put it as a new news ding-dong question mark. I'm pleased I did so. Oh, the Guardian's got a picture of it on one of their stories, have they? I will have to go and check it out. Is it bad? Well, people think Renoir's shite. Nope, that's a swear. People think Renoir's bad. <laughs> oh, I slipped up there. There we go. Um, Oh, Jordan, yeah, the woman who who touched up in that church, touched up the, was it the faith of Jesus? I know it ended up looking like it, it was made of a potato. It was made of a potato. Jesse says it's really bad. Okay, well, I'm going to have to check it out. I will take your word for it. I will take your word for it. Scarlett, I'll be honest with you, I didn't mean to say the S word. Um, I am three hours and ten minutes in, and... Uh, I, I I I I lost I lost track of where I was. <laughs> lost track of where I was. No, I know YouTube doesn't care about um any swears past the first five to ten minutes. However, um to do my very best to keep this page PG thirteen, because I do tell people that they can let their kids watch this. So um if I'm going to talk about a topic that, that is perhaps not suitable for under 18s, I will clearly flag that up at the top of the episode. Um, but I do try and keep it swearing free because I know that some um, adults who are in charge of little people don't, don't like it when the people who are telling their kids history are saying swears. Uh, yes, alas, Jesse, they, I, I'm not in charge of that. The, if you try and post article links in the YouTube, unless I can do it, I can post an article link in the YouTube comments, I think, uh, but it won't let you, and it also won't let you do it in the not chat comments as well. It won't, it won't let you do those things. Um, but if you email it to me, then um, I can happily chuck it up in, as an update for next time. Oh, Shakespeare loved to swear. Loved it. Yeah. Insults are fabulous. Oh, admins can post link. Oh, hang on. My husband just texted it to me. Jamie, could you try and post the link and see if it will work for that in the chat? Post this link. Oh, I mean, it could, it could be worse. Hang on, let me see if I can embiggen it. There we go. So it seems like it's two children, faceless children, being walked by two adult cardigans. <laughs> two adult cardigans seem to be walking it. Um, right, hang on a second. Let me see if I can post it because he's just... Uh, let me see, let me see if I can do this. Let's see. Oh, yes, there we go. There's James Stone, you can see him there. He has just uh, shared it for you. So there we go. It's not good. It's not, but it's not like offensive. It's not good. But and and I've seen I've seen worse myself. I have seen worse. <laughs>
Right. So on to events and and exhibitions, though. It is a bit meh. It is a bit meh. I can see why you think it looks unfinished. I think that there are certain some parts of the canvas that are like look patchy. Um, poop dog likes it. I can see why. I can see why there would there would be. There's a. I think there's a market for a painting like this. I think there's a market for a painting like this. Um, Rumpel still and Sam Parker is talking about Deadpool being the best in of all time. I think I can see where you're coming from. However, the best insulter ever created is Malcolm Tucker. Malcolm Tucker. Without a doubt, without a doubt. So, the National Gallery, until the 21st of July, 2024, is hosting an exhibition called The Last Caravaggio. This is a free exhibition that you can go and check out. Um, but you they do ask you to book a free gallery entry ticket. Now, this is one of the ones where they have got an access page. So you will find that linked beneath the link to this exhibition. You will find the accessibility information there if you wish to click it. So you can find out uh, all of their accessibility availability. That Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, I couldn't find it with this exhibition that's in Cincinnati, Ohio, at the library there. This is Rediscovering Katharina Van Hempson's Scourging of the Christ. Sorry, scourging of the Christ. Uh, you heard me saying big and didn't you? That slipped out. That slipped out. <laughs> it's too late for me. Um, this is going, you haven't got much longer to see this. So if you're in Ohio, you've got only until the 30th of April. Um, I this is this painting is normally in a private collection, so this has been loaned. If you want to check it out and you are there, have have a have a go and have a check. Check it out. Uh Stevenage himself is is this is where he was raised for much of his childhood. It's happening in Stevenage, Jamie. Um, an evening with Alison Weir to celebrate her book, Mary the First, Queen of Sorrows. I believe this is part of her Tudor novels series and you can go and have her talk hear her talk for five pounds and if you want to buy the book as well then that is 25 pounds so if you click a link to that you'll be able to book i could not find the accessibility information for central methodist church that which is where this is happening but i would assume that if you contact them directly they will be able to tell you about the various access that they have. Last, but by absolutely no means least, I have my final slide for you. And this is your friend of mine, one of my wonderful co-hosts from History After Dark, the gorgeous Philippa, who, if you don't know, um, runs her own historical travel company called British History Tours. And she has got an Anne Boleyn tour in 2025. She, they are, they are these these tours are so popular that she is now running two. So there is one tour 29th of April to the 3rd of May 2025, and one tour from the 16th of April to the 20th of May. And you can see this the sites that you go and check out. For example, London Bridge, Hampton Court Palace, Hever Castle, and on that. Tour, uh, Philippa is joined by the absolutely iridescent, glorious Gareth Russell. Uh, I'm sure we are all familiar with Gareth Russell's works, but if you are not, then uh, do check out his recent book on Hampton Court called The Palace. It is gorgeous. It's a love letter to Hampton Court Palace. He also has his another book, if you're into the Tudors, he wrote his book on Catherine Howard, Young, Damned and Fair. 
he's written on the Titanic, just to name a few. Um, so you also get, e e on the first tour, you uh, are there at the Tower of London for the anniversary of Anne arriving as prisoner there. If you're on the second tour, you are there for the anniversary of her execution. There are also talks by other historians as well. You get to have a banquet in the Great Hall at Hever Castle. That is not something that many people get to do. There's also an after-hours tour of Hidden Hever, uh, expert guided tours of the Palace and the Tower of London. They, When you stay at Hever Castle, you are put up in the Astor Wing. And there's also what we were doing at... Sudley with the lovely Sam. If that, if any of that footage that you saw on her page looked fun with us dressing up in Trude dress, you can get to do the, ch the chance to do this on the Anne Boleyn tours because Sam turns up at Heber Castle and helps to put you into Tudor appropriate dress, and uh, you can take some photographs and live and frolic around Heber Castle dressed in the kind of clothing that the lady herself Anne Boleyn would have worn. Um, so if you want to know about any and all things more than, than I have shared, then you please go and check out Philippa's website and also contact her. It is linked at number 37, but the website is www.britishhistorytours.com forward slash history dash tours. Um, sorry, history hyphen tours. And, um, you, you do, uh, Steve. They have boy clothes as well. You can. You. It's not just Tudor gowns. It's also uh, Tudor men's doublets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, crazy Osh lady, because she is all. She gets fully booked. These things. There are not. The Aster Wing is not. Um, you can't get like a hundred people in there. So these, there's a reason why there has to be two or two, two tours because they book up fast. And what I'll also say to you that Philippa told me is that she gets lots of repeat bookers. So it's not, people love doing this so much. They come back to do the same tour again, or to do one of her other tours as well. Uh, she's a fabulous host and she really takes care of people and she makes sure that, you know, She's all covered with like the proper insurances and that, you know, it's it's doing all of the things that you are legally required to do, but that some other individuals don't do. So Lizzie B. So as it says, the first tour, 29th of April to the 3rd of May. So that's what, 5, 20th, 9th, 30th, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, five, 5 days, 4 nights, 5 days. Um, uh, no, yeah. And then 16th to 20th of May, I will, I can't, I don't know if I, if I won't be on the tour, but I'm frequently working at Hampton Court and the Tower. And if I see Philippa, you know that I'm coming to annoy her. <laughs> you know that I'm coming to annoy her. So if I if I happen to be able to come to uh, particularly the tower, um, or I'm already working there, I will come and irritate you all if you come on these tours. <laughs> Do not fear. <laughs> so I'm just going to remove that that is all that i have for you thank you so much everybody who has stuck around on this live if you're watching on the playback thank you for your patience i did there were some tangents i'll be honest uh we did i did have a rant about my three and a half year old more than expected to be honest it came up and i uh i, I dug in jordan fan of nathan nathan is also i have had the privilege of talking to him for a couple of podcasts and he is Fabulous and a great scholar and very, very kind. 
so I'm pleased that you like him because I like him too. I am very grateful for the time that you spent with me. Very grateful to everybody who sent me news items. I'm very grateful to everybody who joined in the live chat and also people who have put things in the comments as well. And if you do enjoy this, if you enjoy my channel, then please make sure you are subscribed. Just have a little check. Uh, make sure you have clicked the bell icon next to the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. We're going to be doing another, another live in a fortnight. There will, of course, be Friday videos this Friday and the following Friday as well. And uh, other things you can do, share the channel, share the videos, uh, share the links. Make sure that you, if you want to be, you are also signed up to my mailing list. If you go to my website, www.trinamarchand.com, go to the contact page, put your email address in the little box, and then I will send you an email once a week with all of the links that you're going to need for the coming days for my content. And I usually chuck in a, a little fun picture of things that I've been up to. Uh, so. I hope wherever you are on your Monday to Tuesday, depending on where you are in the world, that it's been a wonderful Monday so far, uh, or Tuesday indeed, and that you're going to have a wonderful rest of your week as well. So thank you ever so much for taking this time with me. I'm looking forward to chatting to you all in the premiere on Friday, if you can make it, and also hopefully seeing you in the next live that I do. But for now, do take care of yourselves behave yourselves. And if you can't be good, be careful. And if you can't be careful, don't get caught. But for now, do take care of yourselves. It's going to be goodbye from me. I look forward to speaking to you all very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.